And I, uh, and I don't think that's a process question. I think it's a question of substance. It's a wait and see in part. I think you're saying, is there a negotiation to be had here? Uh, an accommodation is part of negotiation as is changing people's minds. I don't think anybody knows that yet. And the gist I got last time, there might be portions of this that seem more negotiable and some that seem less. And I don't know the answers to that because I'm not omniscient. That's quite right. Okay. Well, I'm certain that that's the case. And I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that from, from Roman as well because I, I, I really believe that everyone's trying, I hope everyone's trying to approach this from the point of view that we can resolve this. Um, but I don't want anyone to approach it from the point of view that says we're in a context or a legislative framework that we can't move. I, and I've heard that from a couple of people. I want to make sure that I mean, clearly the legislation contemplates and in fact establishes a dispute resolution mechanism. It doesn't establish a, uh, an objection drop in process. It, it's one in which the, the objections get met and get resolved. And I want to make sure that, uh, that there isn't perceived that there's some legislative barrier to us, both of us moving. And that the, essentially that we end up with the revised and improved RGS at the end of this process. I, I think we should be answering those questions and being clearly quite apparent what our position is. But as far as I understand, this legislation allows you to resolve. How you resolve and what you resolve is going to be dependent upon yourselves and what, you can, what you're able to agree to. And hopefully you can begin to uh, see some of that today. That's the hope. I mean, you, you pretty much have to. Well, you saw some of it the other day. There was fine there, and people saw there might be possibilities. So maybe if we okay. can, and I'm hopeful that there is volition to negotiate. The agreement was to sort of go through sort of person by person around the room for people to raise questions and perspectives. And I'm not suggesting you keep it brief, but there's a number of people here. We've got four hours ahead of us, so let's try to you know stay on task and see what uh, what can become of all of that. But you've been waiting patiently. You've heard what's going on. So I think that it probably starts. I'm sorry, my last comment okay, is sorry. I mentioned it to Jamie a moment ago. I've, I've been sitting for four hours so far today. I have a disability, as most of you know. Um, I've never sat for more than four hours in a row um, since the car accident a few years ago. So this is going, I may be standing and I may be wandering. It's not a, uh, certainly not a disinterest. Okay. Thanks for raising that. So I think, um, if I'm hoping we can stay on the tradition of first names. That's all right. I think, Harold, um, it falls to you to begin the questions or, or sort of view sharing with respect to what's going on. And, yeah, so please. Okay, as, ever, as everyone's aware, uh, I hope it against the regional growth strategy when it came before the board, and I'll get into the reasons uh, why in a minute. But I'm very concerned about uh, the, uh, the challenge to the regional growth strategy. strategy. Uh, and I just want to refer, uh, something happened this week. The um, the Secretary, former Secretary General of the United Nations said that the greatest challenge to our time is food security. And I want to ask question, a question up to put on about food security. What uh, we have seen in Metro Vancouver is the loss of farmland as a major threat to this food security in this region. Farmland that is generally being converted into industrial land. Port Metro Vancouver has, has, is demanding up to about 2,600 acres of farmland should be converted to industrial land. And they say the reason for it is because the cities in Metro Vancouver have already converted so much industrial land to employment lands and residential lands and are continuing to convert. For every acre of industrial land that is converted, converted to some other use, we could see Metro Vancouver, uh, a metro port, converting an acre of farmland to industrial use. And for those that aren't aware, uh, Port Metro Vancouver claims under the federal charter to have the right to usurp the regional planning processes and, and to develop uh, any land that they feel uh, they wish to do so as industrial. And they've only bought 227 acres of farmland in Richmond to do so, and we've been challenging them on it. So this leads to my question that uh, Coquitlam uh, is, is concerned about the, the conversion of industrial land to residential or employment lands as being a local a, a local use and therefore would only require a one-third vote at the regional planning level. And in my opinion, and I'm, this is one of my questions at Coquitlam, does it not follow that actually where there are major um, regional needs, and I'd say the two two of the greatest regional needs are for farmland and industrial land. Should this not require 
not just a majority vote of the regional government, but probably a two-thirds vote instead of a one-third vote at the regional planning level. I think industrial land and farmland are crucial to the regions. So that's my first question. Well, do you want an answer to that question now, or do you want to roll? I'll, 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 I've got the other one follows. Okay. My second question is, has Coquitlam actually thought over the fact that weakening the regional plan uh, regarding industrial land would indeed uh, be the greatest threat to food security in Metro Vancouver because we in, in, in then can anticipate losing vast amounts of farmland as a result. So that's a combined question. Combined question? Do you need a yep. recap of that? You got there. Okay. Well, there are um, two First of all, I, we had, Harold and I have had a couple of discussions, uh, and I think very fruitful discussions about the elements of this, because we both have similar concerns about significant areas of this. He's raising, I think, a concern related to proposal number one. But proposal number one, I've got issues with elements of it, and I think each one of us wants to make that, wants to find a way to make this one work. But uh, the concern that uh, Harold has raised is about the fact that uh, the, under the proposal, if two-thirds of a council has some significant interest in one piece of land uh, moving between urban uses, that's not between agricultural, but between urban uses, um, then th those, that two-thirds can carry unless, uh, unless two-thirds of Metro Vancouver overrides them. So giving over Metro Vancouver a, a veto over a supermajority at the local level. Um, and, and, and it may be that we have to find a different way to do that uh, but the pitch was only that between urban uses, not between agricultural, but between urban uses, we could have that uh, local government uh, essentially be able to define its own destiny, destiny a little bit on individual parcels of uh, unique significance to that local government. Um, and I, but I but I reiterate the, the under the proposal, the municipality may also redesignate any amount of land within the urban containment boundary from one regional urban land use designation to another regional urban land use designation. It was never anticipated that it would uh, involve a farmland at all. Now I understand, of course, that we've seen farmland get redesignated to industrial, and in fact, just recently in Fort McQuillan, where we, uh, a portion of that industrial got redesignated to uh, residential, uh, and was supported, and I supported them as well, because I understood the, the local issues that they were facing. Um, uh, so, but it wasn't meant to apply at all to agricultural land. So. Okay, I, I think my point is that we have a forest out there, Fort Metro Vancouver, that wants us to retain industrial land, and if we don't retain it, they're going to get it one way or the other, and they're simply going to take farmland. So whatever we do within the urban containment boundary reflects on the lands outside the urban containment boundary, because that's what is already happening and will continue to happen. Anyway, and, and you're, you're defining a bigger, a bigger problem. Exactly. And I, and I, I, accept, I accept that's a problem. I don't know that whether we can fix it. Um, our our issue was uh, a completely different part of it, and I, I'm thankful that you pointed out that one element of it because I do think that that's what needs to be worked out. In that. And yeah, I think that's a problem we have. However, I do. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. So that issue, I did not write. No, I realize that. I'm just hoping to consider it because it's yeah, a well, very it's serious issue. Well, yeah. The other issue is the consistency, and I agree with you on the consistency. And I'm wondering, uh, because that's the reason I voted against it. In fact, I thought that equipment was a bit inconsistent because you squeezed in some industrial land into employment plans, which I, I, I that was one of the reasons I voted against it. Uh, the RGS. I also voted against it because Richmond had designated a number of agricultural lands as urban. And Richmond Council saw the errors, error of the ways and have asked now that those uh, urban designated agricultural lands should be as either agriculture or uh, um, parks and recreation, parks and recreation, heritage, heritage and conservation in the regional plan. And on that basis, I voted uh, for the regional growth strategy in Richmond. The question I have is if, if we could get away from this one third vote stuff. Then I then, then I, I can see merit in your proposals on the on the uh, consistency and on and also uh, uh, defining uh, uh, you know uh, I think there's a question of golf courses uh, uh, should golf courses be agriculture or should they be uh, 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 heritage and conservation and so on and some of these plans and I can see some merit in that and I'm just wondering 
if we can't set aside the one-third vote and get rid of it, and, and you don't have to respond to that now, but think about it, but find some way that we can work together to deal with the consistency and, and, uh, and the uh, uh, definitions of the plan uh, out, outside of this, uh, of this uh, challenge of, of a regional growth strategy process. Yeah, no, and I'm, we're perfectly prepared to take that under consideration because I, 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 I recognize exactly what you're describing. I understand the context of what you're describing. And in fact, the, um, you, know, you said Richmond, Saudi Arabia, the ways or whatever, reverse themselves. You know, there was a portion of our lands that we had designated for one reason, for one way, and, uh, and it was actually to try to be consistent. And we have sub subsequently had to, and we've been criticized for it actually, but we subsequently went back and said, no, we'd like to change that back because it's clear that there is no consistency. Um, and as far as the, the industrial lands that uh, got designated as uh, general employment, I would suggest that it's, it's probably more, we're more, probably more consistent with other municipalities now because so many of them have, have done the same thing. And I, and I, so I'm, I'm not taking issues with that. I'm just pointing out that, in fact, we are consistent, and you, you agree we're not consistent. Yeah. There, we should be striving for a greater level of consistency. Yeah. The whole public cities and municipalities did the same thing, and, yeah. uh, with no real definition of what they were doing. Because there were no definitions. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. So I'm, I'm with you on that one. Okay. Yeah. I think you're, you're also saying, yeah, consistency is a common challenge. Uh, is there a way to overcome it without uh, changing the voting mechanism? Is there yeah. other ways to go about doing that? And I, I appreciate that's going to be at the heart of some of these uh, subsequent discussions. Now, Harold, I don't want to cut you off, but I want to know if, if that's that's good for now. That's, that's got it. Appreciate that. And then I think we'll, uh, if we're just going to move along, unless anybody has responses to those particular questions. Peter? The only thing that I would say is our various proposals can be looked at independently, and at the end, we will have to sort of consider a package of uh, proposals as to whether or not uh, that, is, uh, that is enough for our council to sort of consider the ground reserves. But we can consider things independently, and we will do that at the end. Good. Well, thank you, Harold. Um, I think then it goes moves to, to Derek. Thank you. Um, I first wanted to apologize. For the I'm sorry, I'm going to back. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, first wanted to apologize that I haven't been able to attend the other meetings. I'm the uh, chair of the Regional Growth uh, Strategy Committee. And uh, so it is certainly a project that has been close to me over a number of years. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be here. But I think in some ways, when you're the chair of the committee, having others step in isn't a bad idea, because you always question your own objectivity in ensuring that uh, everyone is, is heard after the fact about uh, the decisions that were made, which brings me to first a, a brief comment. The, it is almost an impossible task in legislation to expect unanimity. You know, that when any legislature who comes in and says you must be unanimous on a decision really is creating a set of expectations that are impossible to achieve. Um, it is a situation in which uh, the the difficulties that it is fraught with. I mean, to have a difference of opinion on policy at, uh, when you've got 24 different local governments involved is obvious. I mean, very seldom do we get, uh, get complete agreement on any subject matter. So, you know, we did a solid waste strategy that was much less controversial, had much less interference or interest from, uh, from the business community. But it, uh, it was not approved by Coquitlam, and, uh, and it passed. The GBRD and now is with the Minister of Environment for approval. And the fact that the uh, municipality didn't approve of it was taken account of, but it didn't mean that the plan was no good or that the plan couldn't be achieved or that it shouldn't be approved by the minister. So we're really in a real, quite an anomalous situation where the expectation is that we're to achieve unanimity. And the interpretation that's been given to what we're doing in this process has been somehow that this is a policy debate. This is an opportunity for us all to sit down and debate the policy and whether or not the GBRD or Metro Vancouver should have passed the policies that are contained in the, in the document. 
in my belief, that was never the intention or purpose of the unanimity. The intention and purpose was to make sure that no one municipality was bullied, that no one municipality had an inordinate amount of expectations placed upon it, while others accepted less, that a municipality would be treated consistently with the other municipalities, and that issues of a local concern would be taken into consideration, that metro planning staff and the metro government wouldn't overrule their desire in their own community to be able to reach conclusions about how their community would develop. And that, in fact, is what has occurred throughout the, the process that we've been engaged in. It has been a process in which we ask municipalities to respond to us about their commitments. We didn't tell them what their commitments would be. We said, we want to sign a contract between all municipalities that we agree with each other that we will all make these commitments and that we will uphold those commitments. And then we put in a clause that said, but if you can't uphold the commitments you've made or things change, then we have to have a significant amount of Metro Vancouver agree that the change will occur if it is significant. It's a simple analysis of what happened. It was never an intention that we got into a process where we redebated the basic policies about land constraint. The LRSP passed those. The truth is that these policies diverge very little from what the LRSP did, except it gives the ability to, to ensure implementation and that the commitments will be enforced in regard to the municipalities. But it does very much uh, little more than the LRSP did in protecting agricultural land and protecting containment areas. We, we all expected that, and I think all of us agreed upon it. So. I want to say that, that trying to reach through an arbitration or, or a, a facilitation or a mediation, an area where we discuss policy that has been agreed upon by 23 out of 24 municipalities and we vary that policy to accommodate one municipality is ludicrous. I mean, it can't possibly occur. It, is, it would thwart the desire of the vast majority of municipalities to see the policies they agreed on reach a point where they became a bargaining chip in discussions with a recalcitrant municipality because a piece of legislation quite ridiculously requires unanimity. This was all about Coquitlam telling us how this affects Coquitlam and whether or not in Coquitlam what we're doing is going to have adverse effects that are more in Coquitlam than in other municipalities. That somehow they've been treated unfairly or that their goals and aspirations haven't been recognized. Those are valid concerns to bring forward, and that's the intention of the legislation, not for us to come in and negotiate, renegotiate policy by 23 municipalities with one. They're entitled to disagree and think this, that there should be no regional government. Often, in fact, they express that opinion is that they can say that there is uh, no reason for a regional strategy whatsoever but we're not going to negotiate that issue. And so I think what, what needs to be focused on is what affects Coquitlam directly and how Coquitlam wants to be portrayed within the regional plan. I think that's the issues that should be on the table. I, um, I want to say also that, um, you know, for me personally, this was a great disappointment because we went through a very iterative process one in which we included everybody in the lower mainland in the process of consultation. We wanted to be sure that, uh, that we contacted everyone who might be interested, and particularly that all of the member municipalities were well informed, realized all of the consequences, were aware of their place in the plan, um, individual meetings, the number of meetings we had with the planners, all of those things going on. The meetings I had at the Regional Planning Committee in which battles went on, with uh, mayors or councillors raising important issues at that committee. Um, Judy Duick on behalf of Maple Ridge advocating very strongly for Maple Ridge's position you know, and, and very effectively Rick Green on behalf of Langley. Municipalities stood up, uh, you know, Andrea Reimer for Vancouver, Malcolm Brody for Richmond. People stood up and, and discussed those issues. The reality is that didn't happen with Coquitlam. Coquitlam was not at that table saying, here's our issues, I want to lay these on the table. In fact, uh, in fact, we went through a process with Coquitlam in which we 
reviewed all of their concerns. We, we thought, originally, we had alleviated almost every concern they had, except those that went to the fundamental <coughs> policies that are contained. But all of their local concerns were alleviated. And the last message we had when we, we sent the last draft to them was that they were going to take it to their legal counsel and they may come back with, uh, with a uh, legal opinion and they would have Coquitlam proposals, made in Coquitlam proposals for us. And then nothing shows up. Nothing shows up. And, and none of these issues are put on the table for us to discuss. Their planner is the chair of the committee, the regional technical committee dealing with this. None of these issues are on the table for us to deal with. Instead, what happens is subsequently, after all of this goes out to the municipalities, Coquitlam suddenly says, we have all these objections, all these fundamental policy objections. Not objections to where Coquitlam's plan is, but fundamental policy objections to the whole idea of regional planning and regional enforcement of a regional plan. And that, you know, to me was, was a significant disappointment because I thought that um, given that the mayor of Coquitlam was the vice chair of the regional planning committee, I felt that there could have been far greater good faith shown and that these discussions could have been had in an open forum publicly, politically, in order to, to flesh out the concerns that they had and to make sure that during the process those concerns were, were listened to. Whether they were agreed with or not, they were at least listened to. Instead, we're in a process that's costing significant money that is, uh, is delaying the decisions that are made, holding up 23 other municipalities. And I want to just express my, my disappointment that during the time that we went through, the years of discussion that we went through, that these kind of issues weren't raised by the Coquitlam mayor and councillors so that we would have had these open political discussions and that the press and everyone else would have been able to cover it in the proper forum rather than ending up in the situation we're in now. And I, and I want to ask Coquitlam, why? You know, why during that process did Coquitlam not come forward with the arguments that it's portrayed now, if in fact those issues were so important and so fundamental to Coquitlam? Okay, thank you. I think that's a relatively clear question with some context yep. behind it. Yep. So. No, and I, and I, and I wish uh, uh, Mayor Corgan had been here for when this question was asked earlier. Um, so, but I will, I will repeat as we did before, because uh, there are some clearly some misunderstandings. Uh, this, this is a calcitrant municipality, uh, and uh, Mayor Corgan is right when he characterizes what I believe this process was meant to be from his perspective, which was this is all about how it affects Coquitlam. This is supposed to, we are supposed to look at this as how it affects Coquitlam. I think most municipalities looked at it as to try to figure out how local concerns could be worked through. Uh, when looking at the grand uh, RGS, um, and, and all of their local concerns were alleviated. And I agree, all of our local concerns were alleviated, and that happened in every single jurisdiction. All of their local concerns were alleviated. Um, the concerns that weren't alleviated, and these are concerns that we've raised a number of times, um, were more regional in nature, and they aren't fundamental to the question of whether there should be an RGS. Um, Coquitlam has never, ever expressed as an organization two things that uh, Mayor, Brody, uh, Mayor Corrigan just uh, attributed to us. One, that there should uh, be no regional government. Uh, so the municipality doesn't take that position at all. I know that a council member, and I'm sure you may have one or two council members that have positions that aren't accepted by their councils, um, but uh, we've never taken that position, and we've never taken the position that there should be no regional growth strategy. In fact, our opening comments of the, each one of those two meetings that we've had before is that we fully support the regional growth strategy and the development of a regional planning process and none of our council members are more supportive of regional planning than me. Um, and so when we, I mean, Mayor Corrigan actually went to the extent of suggesting that they put in a clause. Well, no, actually those were in the legislation. The legislation is, it sets out that if there is a dispute with one municipality having an issue that can't be resolved or hasn't been resolved, then it goes through this process. Now, I accepted every letter uh, and every principle set out in the legislation as, as our, our, our municipality. We accept the legislation. The act is, we have to accept it. It's, you know, and we, we could argue with it, and Mayor Corgan obviously disagrees entirely, fundamentally, with the legislation that sets out 
a process where if something's going to be binding on all of us, we all agree ahead of time. And, uh, and that's what this is. If someone's going to uh, take the, some of our local jurisdiction and they're going to take it upon uh, at a different level. And the legislation set out by the government that passed it says that you can't do that without everyone's approval. And so each one of them has to work through their differences. And I, we've worked through all of our differences that were local in nature. And one of our concerns is that each municipality likewise has done that. And, and as a result, we ended up with something that is uh, less consistent. And we've raised this, the consistency one is a little bit newer, but everything else, um, and it's a little bit newer because it only comes to light as you start to examine the evolving uh, regional growth strategy. But everything else was raised uh, long before um, Mayor Corrigan says it was raised. And in fact, uh, this is the letter from October 15th from um, Mr. Carline, outlining every single one of our the objections that we have today. And that was a year ago, or not a year ago, it was eight months ago. Um, and those are concerns that we raised prior. And I know Metro Vancouver heard them because they even put them in their letter. So um, I, I think a little bit issue with, with Mayor Corrigan's suggestion that I think we're, these are brand new issues. No, these are issues that we were very clear about. And we continue to be quite clear about. Um, these are issues that affect every municipality, um, but they're issues that we weren't asked as municipalities, and Mayor Corgan said it quite clearly, I think. We weren't asked to look at those. We were look, only asked to look at how it affects us. Well, if no one is going to look at how it affects the, the actual uh, ability of the RGS to meet its stated objectives, stated objectives then uh, is this a good process or a, a flawed process? I'm not suggesting it's a flawed process. I'm suggesting that process we're in right now, a process set up in legislation, is appropriate. I won't argue with it. I know Ms. Mayor Corgan uh, takes offense that we have to do this, but it's set up in legislation, and I'm hoping that it will be a constructive process that results in a better RGS. I take the position that the RGS isn't perfect, that it could be improved. Um, if Mayor Corgan thinks it can't be improved, that's fine. He's allowed that opinion, but I, I think it can be improved, and we um, made things raised some of those concerns uh, a year ago, some of them more recently, uh, but we are hoping that we'll be able to come to some conclusions about how, how we can improve it. And I think, uh, Andy, do you want to add some comments? And there's going to be a tendency to want to go back and forth a bit on this, but we're going to have to allow time for everybody to, to chime in, because I know there's follow-ups. Was it, I won't say what's interesting to me, but uh, something's striking me. Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> um, a lot of these issues, and I wish you hadn't been here for the last meeting, because I think it was rather a little bit progressive, at least in my mind, in any event. I think there was acknowledgement that um, the consistency issues and uh, what is regionally significant in that, I think we sort of all came to a middle of the, the road that maybe that stuff that we can we can work on together and, and that maybe there is, you know, something missing in the teapot in that one. My big issue here and I've discussed this with you, and I just can't get by it, is the fact that when I sign up the regional growth strategy document, I'm committing my council to 30 years to this agreement, unless the Metro must consider whether to take a, a rethink, a rethink of this document every five years or seven years or whatever we put on it. Now, when we discussed this with staff, and no matter how many times we went around it, um, I even went out myself and got a couple of legal opinions just to, to make sure I wasn't you know, following the wrong path. Our lawyer is here today, and no matter how we look at this, I still feel that every signatory to this agreement should have the ability somehow to be heard and to bring forward on the premise of the document, not on their individual city things like, can we flip this parcel from park to here or flip this parcel? That, that to me is, most of that stuff, I think Johnny and his team have negotiated within the regional contact statements. And that's probably, looking back, it, it doesn't help the consistency in all those issues, but probably for where we are now, that was, I guess, maybe about the only way you could handle it. My issue is still the five-year kick clause, which I call it my business, and somehow I've got to find a way to get around that. There has to be a way 
for all the smaller communities to be able to come together and say, we, not just Metro must consider, but you, we have to do this. There has to be legislation put in this document or a clause that says, we will, you will do this. And then, I mean, the voting, and, and this is where I think we have, a, we have an error here in, in, in a way, but not. When we went with all our proposals and we came to you, we also put solutions in. And everybody jumped on the solution saying, oh my God, we can't do this, or oh my God, this isn't a bad idea, or whatever. We put solutions in because we thought it would be a way to start discussions. And maybe some of them were a little over the top, or maybe they weren't. It depends on your perspective. I want to deal with the issues that we have. I want to come up with solutions that are going to work for everyone. And I, in my business, I would never allow a client to sign up to an agreement for 30 years that would bind not only his family, but the subsequent children of that family. And we're binding our cities, I believe, and the people coming after us. And I can, if you want, get Jan Bennett to give a legal opinion, but I don't think I need to do that at this point in time. And this is my, this is my burning big issue, so. I'm done. Okay. I can just uh, just add some quickly, yeah. you know, and uh, I will be quick. I want to first of all say that uh, that certainly part of the process we engaged in was not simply to raise problems. Everybody did. You can look back on anybody's record. We raised issues about autonomy, consistency, and everything else. The question is, what do you propose as solutions in a timely manner? Not after the fact, but what during the course of the debate and the, and the consultation do you propose as alternative measures to the ones that are proposed so that the other members can have a look at those proposals, make any choices that they want? And so, so the, you know, the, the idea that somehow Coquitlam came forward with these things during the process is, in my view, inaccurate. Coquitlam did raise objections to different parts of the plan, and I mean, you can, you can shotgun out like every municipality did concerns. The question is, do those solutions come forward during the consultation process so they're put on the table? I've examined all of the documents and I don't see any of those things. I see us resolving the concerns that were expressed. Second thing is, there can be, we have to do a transportation plan. You cannot expect that we are gonna do a transportation plan for the lower mainland and you cannot have a plan unless every municipality agrees. Now. That would be ludicrous. That would be ludicrous to expect there could be no transportation plan unless every single municipality signs on and they all have the power to veto and there's a process of arbitration. It can't work. It couldn't work on a solid waste plan. It can't work in any sense. So what I'm saying in this is that, that because you can do something doesn't mean you should. No, because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Holding up 23 municipalities on an issue like this that is really about policy decisions that are made at the board level with your representatives, two representatives from Coquitlam participating in that discussion, with your mayor as the vice chair of the committee that discusses this issue, those kind of policy decisions at the regional level are ones that we all participate in. And during the process, we consult the councils to find out what their response is to these policies and if there are alternatives proposed. That didn't happen until after the fact, and that's why I'm critical of the way it was managed by uh, by Coquitlam in regard to spot responding to this. And also, when I say the legislation, if there were legislation that said we must be unanimous on transportation, on solid waste, on a liquid waste plan, I'd say that were ludicrous too. I would say that is not the way to run something, is to have an expectation that there's a veto power on part of any municipality who happens not to agree with the general policies that that 23 other municipalities have agreed on. Okay, and then I think we'll have to move on because this could go a while and I know a lot of other people are waiting. Okay, thank you. We did bring this up. We brought this up all throughout the process. Mr. Carline came to our, our, our council meeting, I think, a couple of times. But we have, and I believe through Mr. McIntyre, who was on there, I don't know what other staff got involved with it, but we did, I, I know we did. As a council, we brought these issues up. Where it fell down, I don't know, dear, but we did bring it up all along. And that's all I have to say. And the distinction I'm hearing is it's a bringing up of concerns versus a bringing up of proposals that meet those concerns. 
well into the process, and, and there's some difference of, oh, yes, we did bring those up, but it was late in the process, it should have been done differently. But this whole notion of unanimity, if I can say one thing, people say it's ludicrous, it's almost impossible to achieve, and part of achieving it means there's going to be a lot of uh, meeting of local expectations. So you create the need to accommodate locally. And you've done that, and I think what them said it's, it's happened, but I think you're saying we're wearing the regional hat to improve the regional plan, and that's what we're coming here advocating. It's less of a Coquitlam specific thing, it's more on behalf of the regional strategy as a whole. And I think, May, you're saying, what co causes me some fear, maybe keeps me up at night, maybe that's going too far, is we don't have the ability to trigger uh, a review. Exactly. And if there's a way to consider doing that, and I don't know how, maybe some of those concerns would be alleviated. As we go through uh, the further questioners, so I'd be interested in, in them addressing that question as to whether they feel they want that kind of protection of a reduced ma uh, majority of it of a one-third to address some of these concerns. Because Harold did read, Harold mentioned that, so for those of you who have things to say, if you want to chime in on the whole voting structure that, that I think some are quite concerned Actually, actually Harold's concern was related to a different um, solution. It was a different issue entirely. I think Harold's concern was related to the possibility of a redesignation uh, with a two-thirds vote of council that isn't overridden. And a one-third vote? Yes, isn't the, okay. And a one-third vote of Metro. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost finished my sentence. Um, that uh, the concern was uh, about a two-thirds vote of council that isn't overridden by a two-thirds majority at Metro, which essentially means that if there's more than one-third of Metro that, uh, that that thinks that, uh, that 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 proposal has merit, then uh, the two-thirds majority at the council carries it. That's a different issue, though, entirely than the one that, that was on the floor here. Um, Mayor Corgan didn't bring that up at all. I mean, Mayor Corgan's concern was the possibility that, um, well, his main concern seems to be that we <coughs> have to accommodate uh, Coquitlam. Well, the legislation says that you do have to work out these differences. And I know, I, I'm afraid we're repeating our first tells from the first meeting and from the second meeting. Um, and that's why we were really looking for, you know, a select number of representatives that could attend all the meetings. We have tried to, as best we could to attend every single meeting and one of us has, has arrived, but she, she was late, stuck in traffic. Um, the, the challenge before us is that if we have to repeat these things at every meeting, we're never going to get anywhere. But if we get back to a fundamental objection over the legislation in meeting number three, then I don't think we're going to get anywhere in, in, at all. The legislation says that we now have to work this out. And it treats planning differently, and I guess it's because it's taking power from... Um. And we're going to have, and, and again, sorry, well, he, he went on at length. He, 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 you asked for it. questions only, he did a... We're, we're, and that's what, there's going to have to be a bit of a dis discussion, because if we go at this pace, it'll take the four hours. I agree. And, I, and people have been waiting to speak, and there's the, the tendency to ask a question and get an answer promotes a desire for a further response, and on and on you go. So we're talking a bit about the commitment to this negotiated resolution process is getting mixed in with this notion of, here's the concern that I've got. Uh, Views of how these concerns were managed over time, this notion of the ridiculousness of unanimity, the localized dealing with concerns, and I think Coquitlam's saying, locally it's been tackled. We're coming here to enhance the regional strategy, um, and people are going to comment on that. And there's going to be very different views around the table about how this developed, why it developed, etc. But we're going to have to move on. Um, and there's going to be tendency for a bit of back and forth, so I don't want to cut anybody off, but I do want to give everybody opportunity. Go Let's go. Um, maybe. I think we're focusing again on the solutions we put forward, which may not be perfect. I just want to focus on our objections. Maybe someone else has got a solution that might work. Well, I'm hopeful that's going to happen later today, that people have counter-proposals or possibilities. Okay, um, Wayne, I think it's over to you now. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I guess I'm one of the smaller cities, of which there's 16 smaller than uh, Coquitlam. And uh, in our position, we've gone back. And when I read your, your information when it first came, when the second sober thought, I took it back and I said, look, council, you go ahead, look at this. What can we bring up? What do we have of our interests that have been impinged upon? Or are we afraid of anything? And the fact of it was, there was nothing. They said, go back and listen to see if there's something more substantial to it for Coquitlam. And then if there's something for Coquitlam, because you're our neighbor, then we should be looking at that to see if we can uh, facilitate to you get what you want. But as far as what we were concerned with as a region uh, and for what we wanted out of the RGS, it was done. And so from there, I think I spoke to the good mayor um, at one of the uh, events that we held 
And he said, what's going on? And I said to him, I said, well, we can do this without going into this particular arbitration or however we're, we're looking at it. And uh, um, it hasn't gone that way because once you open up Pandora's box, I think just it just gets more and more. And we've been here now. This is the, probably the 12th hour. And uh, I'm not sure how much further we're getting until we get to some of the solutions. Now, May, what you brought forward, which was quite good, you got a specific uh, question about timing. And I think we'll have to address that. That's one of the things. And if it's there, uh, there'll be an answer why or how. And um, I think we're able to accommodate something, at least to know what it is. Um, but for small communities, I've also taken it upon myself to ask, and it hasn't been one other mayor, and there's small communities that I've asked to come forward, and do you want to change? I mean, I'm there for one of the uh, us together. And I've suggested, and I've just, we'll become the coalition of the small, okay? And if that's what we need, and if we need that power base, we'll get it, because everything I've ever seen in this chamber for the past nine years has been fair. The votes have been fair, and, and the intentions of the, the majority is always one that we might not agree with, but it has been something that we've been able to get the results to move forward. So I, I think today that uh, what I'd like to do, and I'd like to, to be one of the ones that says, let's put this to bed, let's get the, the cities together, and let's make sure that uh, what we can do, because let's face it, our two cities, we've got bigger, as big a things that are gonna impact on our two cities together, rather than, than having uh, something here that doesn't seem to be getting uh, to the point of it as quickly as we all like. So I have no question, except that I would impair, ask everyone, let's move forward quickly. Let, let's not rehash too many of the old things. Let's not just talk in the periphery. Let's get the specific items on the board and let's get them done. Okay, and I just want to welcome Selena and Bruce have arrived. Um, we're in, as you can tell, there's sort of a question of perspective sharing and some responding. We're, we've decided to go around the room that way, so everybody's getting a chance to chime in, so it's, I'm glad you, you, you made it. Um, and again, uh, you know, I'm all for it. What do you need to do to hone in on particular ways that you can resolve this? There's, there's proposals in here. May saying those are just starters. Maybe not starters, but those are possibilities. If there's counters, if there's other ways that address the fundamental motivations behind our proposals and objections, throw them out there, let's see if we can work with that. And that's usually how negotiations go. I start here, you start there. We share ideas and opinions and, and, and people create something. And I hope you can get there because people are anxious to get somewhere. And uh, this is the 11th and a half hour. So, um, any response? That was a perspective versus that a question, I think. That's going to be more productive, so let's just agree. Stay with it. Let's stay with it. And I don't know when people are gonna to begin to say, okay, here's an alternative way to do that that I think meets your objectives and meets ours. That's what's going to have to happen for anybody to agree. I don't think anybody's going to give up and give in here. So unless creative different approaches that are satisfactory to the parties who are in dispute are created, maybe this does get left to a third party. And I think that's big risk, but I won't say more on that. Well, I, okay, I, I, on, the, on the last point, simply, we don't have a vested interest. This isn't about how it affects Coquitlam. This is about our perception of how it affects the region. And we know that we've, we've had other municipalities accept our point of view or our or, or suggestions on, or at least the beginning of discussions on certain of the points. In fact, the last meeting was one of the municipalities came forward. It is recognized that the suggestion of Coquitlam on the five-year process that Councillor Reed just suggested. It wasn't a question. Well, and, and people are going to get fastidious about right, this. this. It's cool. questions, perspective sharing, and I'm, I'm hopeful that this is not just about getting questions asked and answered. It's going to lead you into some new possibility of negotiation, to some new possibility emerge that is satisfactory to those around the table who need to agree. The, and how you use your four hours. You introduced this as we have some questions from these members. And, and if the members don't have a question, then I, I, I don't know why they, they give a seven minute speech well, and expect that I'm not allowed to respond to any inconsistencies. On this particular one though, we do have municipalities like well, this one here where it was, uh, this is a former municipality, it is recognized that the suggestion of Coquitlam on the five year process related to what May Reed was talking about has some merit. That's a municipality that um, tends to agree that it has some merit. That doesn't necessarily mean it's they agree with the, the exact solution. It means that we it's some place we can discuss. We don't have a vested interest in the exact solution. And when Burnaby suggests that it has some merit, it means that you're right, this might be able to be tweaked. And I'm perfectly fine with that discussion, but I'd like to see the questions relate to how can we tweak this one. Then maybe I better speak to your first question that you asked about my statements the last time about the room to play in this whole thing. We have a, 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 a regional growth strategy that has been accepted by 23 of 24 municipalities. That's the context in which we are speaking. So we're not here to say, 
gosh up in the air, how can we make this thing better? What we are here to do is to see how we can resolve whatever the issues are that you have. But, uh, but I can tell you now, when we come to fine-tune uh, suggestions, the idea of going back to the cities, which if we change the strategy at this point, that's what we've got to do. We've got to go back to all the cities. That is not going to be on. So please, we have to keep your con comments in the context of where we are. We're not where we were two years ago, where we, any constructive comment would be entertained. So, so you're saying that we, well, this, yeah. this process will not result in a change of the RGS? Uh, yes, that, that's, that's what we're, we're looking okay. at the caucus. Okay, caucus and then, okay. And I'm going to say, if, if I, I'm hopeful that people are saying, well, maybe there's other processes, places which some of these concerns could be addressed outside of the RGS. That's what you think can happen. You think it can happen. Not, well, the legislation says it can happen. And we, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we discussed can. this the last time as to some of the possibilities that we have. But yeah, like uh, I think it was five and six. The possibility is that we can have a have no, the staff group go off and talk about it. We can take uh, proposal number three and we can resolve that as part of the budget process and the, the traditional annual accounting process. You know that we can resolve that we will do this, but that's not a change in the RGS. No, I understand. The Act sets out how the RGS, how the objections to the RGS shall be resolved, and how the process for handling those objections and for therefore perhaps amending the RGS would be handled. And one of the parties to this process of dispute resolution has already said that that's not on. Uh, so I'm I'm just going to have to talk with with my colleagues, I guess, because we entered this in good faith. We entered this from the point of view that. We want to resolve the dispute. I'm perfectly fine under some circumstances of submitting something to a, an implementation agreement or something. And I think we would accept that. But, but why are I, you walking out? I'm not Wait, but I think that the concern here is if, there's, just, if, if one party has no desire to amend the RGS, they'll amend possibilities outside the RGS. I think to you that represents there's really no negotiability within the context of that legislation. And we were anticipating there could be possibility there. Well, all I'm, I guess what we're we're going to come back and say probably is that why would the RG, why would the legislation say that amending the RGS is one of the possibilities of resolving a dispute and then have one of the parties to the dispute resolution say no it's not one of the possibilities that's not, not, not well, I, and that so, might be a, a, so a negotiating Chair, opinion yeah Mr. Chair, we are we are here we are here to talk through the issues the members of the Intergov Committee and the participating governments want to ask questions or say something. And I think that it behooves us now to listen to them. Uh, regard, regardless of where this is going to go in the end, uh, I think we need to focus and I think we need to move forward. What about your, uh, your proposal for, a, I'm hoping, a brief caucus? Steve, this is a fundamental, maybe a watershed moment, don't know. <laughs> well, I'm just hoping that we were both entering this from the point of view that the Act is right, that the Act says that we're going to try to resolve this, we're going to, if necessary, make amendments. And, and, and right now, one of the parties has said, no, that's not... I would just wait on that. I have my, my suggestion... I, I, so I think I, I do want to talk to my colleagues, and maybe we don't have... Maybe we can go down the end of the line, I don't know. Or, but, I, I, I would like to hear everybody finish and This is why we're here. The board has asked the committee, and they're all here except one. And, you know, I mean, your plan isn't here either, so that's okay, right? No, I know. We, but we, I they are here to ask questions and try and figure out what the problem is. That's why we're here. We're not here to negotiate. Remember we talked about negotiations? That's not what the facilitator's position was. That is not what we were here for. This is a facilitator, not a negotiator or, uh, uh, or, or you know, other. Uh, so, is here to ask questions to try to understand what the actual problems are. We have gone over the, uh, the, the, uh, the report, the proposals, and the problems, but it's the committee that has to make the recommendation back to the board. That's who's making the recommendation back to the board. And the board will decide what will happen with this issue. So we're trying to find out from each of these people in their own way what, you know, what the problem is and why has had this uh, you know, ninth hour uh, problem 
with the plan that everybody else seems to be in, in concert with. So, uh, it was my understanding, uh, Mr. Chair, that in the very beginning instance that all the people here and all the people that were appointed by the councils would be allowed to speak, and they're speaking, and that's why people where we are. We're not negotiating. And there's a fundamental difference of views around the table of what it means to resolve a, to, re, to resolve the dispute. Because resolving the dispute is the outcome. How you go about it is through discussion. And discussion, when you problem solve, is, in my mind, what I've been doing, is negotiation. I'm not a negotiator. I'm hoping you negotiate, problem solve, create together, and then recommend a satisfactory consensual solution. If that's not possible, it will be resolved on your behalf. Not through discussion and interaction, through somebody determining. That's going to happen. So the hope is by participating, by sharing views, by me saying, I don't know what the formula is, but that fear has to be recognized. What do you think, guys? That's where negotiations begin to take off. Well, the negotiation begins with people asking questions, trying to understand what the problems are. That's and we welcome start. any questions. Okay, we'll so sit through any questions might have. So I didn't realize that. My understanding is no caucus now. Back to questions. Is that okay? You go ahead and let's let's hear from yeah. the rest of the members. I do really want to hear from them, but I also wanted to hear from them in the context that we were actually both approaching this from the point of view of resolving. And I realize now that some people don't think we're we're going to be negotiating or resolving. And I don't know. But okay. Well, let's just listen to the questions, and maybe they will lead in a solution-based direction, and and you will uh, really achieve something. So, Daryl, over to you. Thanks very much, and I uh, I, I certainly hope my comments or help us move towards a resolution. Just my own comments to, to Selena and back of Johnny's head and, and Richard that, and May. Um, so, I, so you can take them as you like and I, I'd love to hear your response to them. But, uh, I've been on the, the Regional Growth Committee now, the Planning Committee for I guess uh, since I was first appointed five and a half years ago and I was Vice Chair for a while. And and I, I certainly see where you're coming from in terms of trying to, to say where we want to look at the entire region and while some municipalities might not be taking that view, that you're, you're trying to do that. And it's like trying to help someone across the street. You want, you're, you're trying to help them. So I appreciate that. Sometimes you may not need the help, but it doesn't mean you get slapped for trying to help. So I, I wanted you to view these comments as sort of helpful. And what has come up a couple things. One was, was speaking for the, the smaller municipalities. I think I'm probably the smallest municipality. We have 50,000 people here. Five, five and a half square miles. We're, we're quite compact and small. And we've had extent. Sorry, tiny, tiny. tiny. We have we have had extensive discussions with with the regional growth strategy, the liberal regional strategy before that, and the RGS now at our council, both uh, in work sessions. Uh, our staff have been involved for a number of years to help explain where we're headed to with this. And council has had some really good debate about should it be made stronger, should it be made weaker, should we, you know, a designated industrial land, should we designate agricultural lands? How do we how do we improve the situation for the region? And there's been some real differences of opinions on our council. But there really has. There's been people saying we need to have much more teeth at the metro level to really enforce municipalities to do what we would like. And there's others that say that we, you know, we don't want municipal or regional government telling us what to do in our land. So we've had quite a bit of to and fro on that. But at the end, we came up with the, the, the resolve, and it became unanimous at the end, to support what was put before us in this. And they were informed. And, I, and so I just want you to know that as one of the smaller municipalities, probably one of the smallest here, that we have taken an extremely good look at this document, at the process, and what it means down the road for us, and we've agreed to, to be a part of that. And with, with some likes and dislikes, but we've, we've said as a whole we want to be a part of that. Another uh, issue that did come up was the, was the five-year update, and I know maybe you brought that up. And there was some discussion about, you know, maybe that is, is too far away, and there's some say it's not far away enough. So we, we've had those differences of opinions on our council. What did emerge, though, is we wanted it to have some teeth. So we didn't want the, the RGS to be able to be so flexible that if after a year, you, you know, the council has changed, new election in November, and they want to do some big development or something like that, that they could go ahead and with only one third of the metro board saying uh, we're opposed and two thirds saying we could look at that. We didn't want that. We wanted more strength at the regional level. And we did have a really active discussion on that. We know that there has to be updates, periodic updates. We're doing our OCP right now. Our OCP is done every 10 to 15 years and we're going through the process now. So we looked at it in that context as well. 
but we were happy enough to say that we can go over the five years because we need to protect the agricultural land, we need to protect our industrial land. And we're one of the benefits beneficiaries of changing industrial land over to to some uh, residential land right before Alonso where our old shipyards used to be. But we realize that, that we can't let that happen any farther. We have to really draw some lines here. So it, the, the growth plan needs some teeth. So we were supportive of that, the fifth, the, the, the five years. But finally, there seemed to be some notion, um, I don't know whether you said it here, but almost implied in, the, in some of the media that we're hearing, that if we, if we adopt this plan, there'll be no more reason, ability to grow. There, there, there won't be any land left for our residents and people that, I don't think it was you guys, no. But I want to I want to ensure that people realize that the city of Vancouver is probably the poster child, second to Vancouver in the province on how you can grow with a very limited land base. We're surrounded by the district of North Vancouver. We can't grow out, and yet we're growing at a good one one and a bit percent a year, every year, and adding people into our municipality in a very sustainable way. We have only 17 percent of our residents live in single family homes. 83 percent live in multi family homes. And so we're able to have that growth. We're able to do growth in our communities by being smarter, by doing laneway houses, by building multifamily dwellings, by having some apartment towers. And it works towards those, all those other goals in the, in the RGS, which is supporting transportation and regional economic development and getting people out of their cars and doing those things. So we, with that, also wanted you to realize, because I know that it's been brought up, that, that we have been able to be successful with the plan. So while um, maybe the question is, do you realize um, that there are restrictions, we think that the plan that we've got before us is going to allow us to do that. So I, on one hand, I want to say thank you for, for trying to speak up to support some of those municipalities that may not be here or not. But we've had a really good, thorough look at the plan. And we think the pros outweigh the cons. And we want to be a part of the consensus building here to allow us to, to move forward with the plan that is much needed before the next election, and if it happens, then we'll have to go through new councils, and it's going to be left off. And I think in the region as a whole, really is harmed by that. So that's my point. Thank you, and I absolutely agree. The pros outweigh the cons. Um, the glass is more than much more than half full. Uh, we're just trying to, uh, and I think that was the what the legislation envisioned is that we would uh, examine ways to improve things at this point. And and as far as your municipality goes. I, we applaud you. Coquitlam has taken the bus ride out there, has, has hopped on the bus and gone to see your house and gone to see uh, laneway housing and some of the developments and we've adopted much of that and this is largely the, the, the work of uh, Councillor Reed and, and chairing the Land Use Committee in our Housing Choices Program to try to densify our community and to make it more sustainable because while we do have a greenfield, the vast majority of development in the lower mainland has to take place within the, uh, the existing neighbourhoods. Uh, we're not going to be doing Greenfield much more, and, and of course the urban containment boundary we completely support that. So how do we make it a little bit better? And, and so our, our challenge is not that the glass is empty here; it, it's it's almost full. We can we can tweak this to make it actually better than the approach that we took. And we had the same kind of divisions on council as to some saying Metro should have that. Well, a couple saying Metro should, should have absolutely no authority here, and others saying, well, no, this is a region that needs to function together and can't be 22 distinct. Uh, jurisdictions with uh, absolute autonomy, and uh, we don't want either one of those extremes. We're trying to work it out. Okay, I think we can move on, and I guess um, one of the, it's not for me to ask a follow-up question, but um, with respect to what May was saying, because I think this is a pretty fundamental piece, I mean, your council deliberated about this as five years too long, is it too short, is it got the teeth, and I think you came to the conclusion over time that yes, it did, and I wonder about the fear that some have expressed, and I heard you May say it, and I think uh, when you addressed it, saying, no, I've been, on, I've been at this table before and I see it fair, that what do you do about the fear, and I think it's fear, that you get locked into something and that if you're a smaller player, and I, I use that word, word, word uh, description loosely, and you want to trigger a review, and the big players don't get on board, where does it leave you? Am I, is that enough? And I think, because I, I know you went partly there, Daryl, maybe you don't want to answer that, but I, if there's any way that you can begin to alleviate that, there, there might be something in the making. But anyway, I don't want to go too far. I'm sure I'll get put in my place. Uh, I, if I may, yeah. I, I think Daryl has very nicely and concisely put his points forward. And they discussed it, and it wasn't imperative to them. To me, it's a huge issue, but that's just to me. Okay. But the point is, I, I will say one thing. Without the re a definition, which is one of our 
of the definition of regional uh, significance and without consistency, I, I think in, in this uh, the, the kitty for a regional growth strategy, Johnny and his staff actually did go out and do the negotiations on, you know, on the, with the regional context statement. So all, all of the things that you've come up with, the things that most people are debating have already been done and I think can continue to be addressed through the regional context statement. This fundamental issue that I have can't be addressed there, and, and that's why we're here. And, and that's you're happy here. with it, and that's fair. The, the only comment I would just say is, is that I guess there there is a mechanism in there to, to, to trigger uh, an evaluation, but it's a much higher threshold than I understand that you're you're wanting, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Not extra. Metro can trigger it, and, and that's the problem. And I mean, it's the board. Let's consider a review every five years. Consider a review. That's that's what it says. Consider. That's what the legislation says. Yeah. So so the, the proposal we have is that if a significant percent, if a significant number of, of local governments um, wanted a review, could we could we make it so that the review has to happen? Whereas you know you said you um, well, I'm not sure it was you were made uh, uh, right that said that local is 16 or, or, or 16 communities smaller or something. Well, if all 16 of them wanted a review under the current process, they don't get one. If the, if the smallest 16 communities wanted a review, and the, the, the largest communities are, are happy with it, then the review doesn't take place. We don't even review it for 30 years. So we could, we could put in a process that says, OK, well, how about if we make it so that a significant number of group of people, let's say a million people across the region, uh, in their municipalities wanted a review, then that's enough. Or it, or set it up. And I'll tell you, and I know that uh, a couple of people might be concerned about it, where this came out was our original thought was, you know, why don't we just make it so that the RGS is reviewed every five years? It's just automatically reviewed every five years. Not that we automatically have a vote here at council whether to review it every five years, but we actually review it and we make it better every five years. And we, uh, we accommodate those concerns that are, are there. I'm not sure that that's the case. I think the case can be that we can find a threshold that says that a significant portion of the of Metro Vancouver wants it reviewed. Let's have a look at it. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to defer uh, to John, but my understanding was that if, if you're going to get that 60 municipalities, they're going to talk about it, the board is going to consider that. So we're going to consider it every five years, and we're going to have to look at it. I personally think that that's too soon, personally. I think that we need even more teeth to the RGS than less. And that it's, it's not that we want to put more farmland in, it's that we're, we're moving away from having that, the erosion of that, of those types of lands. And we need those types of lands. So, you know, I, I'm going the other way. No, it's okay. You see, and, and you're perceiving that I am too. And we, I'm not. I'm actually, what, what happens if we find a gap and something is, is clearly not working and we're not protecting lands in the way we thought we were? And, and uh, Harold Steves actually just suggested one where I hadn't even contemplated that, okay, we'll then admit, then pork actually grabs more land because of some other consequence. The law of unintended consequences raises an issue two years from now, and we have to wait 10 years or 30 years before it automatically gets reviewed. And if it, if it is the case that one, if one third, if it was the case that the bottom 10 municipalities raised the question and it was reviewed, then why not codify that? Why don't we just say that <coughs> okay, when it, will automat it will get reviewed? This is will address yeah. the full circumstances of review in due course. Yeah. Please. Okay, we're going to move on to Greg. But this is a discussion and people are getting their views heard, so let's continue. And I appreciate the effort. Thank you. Correct. One thing that the uh, chair has, has said that there was a real fear uh, of anyone bringing something forth uh, that would never, ever happen in this room. The very was, smallest one. How long did you say? I was reflecting uh, what I thought May, May's motivation was for the concern around. Um, the, the triggering of the review. I think there's a fear that it couldn't occur if a, if a smaller group wanted it to occur. I was reflecting the fear that I think motivates that. But there's no fear. There may be a concern. Even the smallest, tiniest community, the the uh, Quasim Indian Band, and, uh, anyone in this room has always had the ability to come forward, and there is no fear in this room. I just want to make that clear. Okay. Thank Wrong you. Sir, I'm sorry. I heard it. I've heard it. I Can we move on, okay, well, please? Well, again, I, I use the word fear because I perceived it and picked it up as a listener, and uh, there's, there's different views about that. It can't be the case that you're allowed to say anything, and we have to move on when I try to. So again, I, that was my choice of words. <laughs> I thought I was reflecting accurately what somebody said, and there's, there's differences about that. Greg, I think it's over to you. And we have to keep moving because it's 2.15. Okay. Um, 
I, you know, not to say what everybody else was saying. We were all here to make the right choices and to, to move on. So that's fine. I guess you know I, when I did read the document, I was I was um, I was wondering why Coquitlam thought that they needed to give everybody else a sober second look. You know, I, I went back to our council. I gave them your document, and we looked at it. and We thought we had to. 10 years or five years of sober second looks, and we were okay with it. That's why we stuck our hand up, and that's why we agreed with it. Um, so I, 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 it didn't start your, in my opinion, it didn't start your document off on a strong foot by saying that we weren't doing our job in our ministry. <coughs> um, but to get to some of the points more specifically, the, the consistency of the land and the watering it down, and, and I think everybody agrees, but that was the only way, and we were gonna get to the point where we had all but one agreeing with the land use designations. If we hadn't, we never would have gotten here. Um, and if it was that important, I guess I, I wonder why Coquitlam didn't stand up to those principles and say, okay, our land in certain areas is industrial and we're gonna keep it industrial. We're not gonna water it down like other municipalities have uh, to give us the most flexibility at the end of the day. Um, and I guess that, you know, there's a principle there of, of that and so, um, yeah, it's, it's easy to maybe point fingers at, at others to, to say, why didn't you do more, why didn't you, you know, I think someone's mentioned Richmond a couple times, but why didn't you, and I'm familiar with Richmond, but why didn't you protect more of your industrial land? Why did you take it to general urban or uh, that sort of thing? And so I guess that's a concern of, of the position. Um, I guess my, my main point here of, of something that I, I just can't vision how we get past, and I'm hoping you can shed some light on it. Uh, if that's okay that I ask a question. Um, you talk about regionally significant, and, and that's just such a broad term. And, and in your suggestion, um, you talk about a way to move forward is maybe to have a one-year time frame, and that the, the TAC can look at that. One, I would suggest that maybe TAC shouldn't, because that's, although it's an open meeting, it's kind of a closed meeting, nobody knows when they occur. I would suggest, based on your principles, that you'd want that to be in a form like this, that people could uh, videotape and participate in. Um, but I guess I would try to understand what is even a starting point from Coquitlam's perspective of what is regionally significant. Is it economic value? Is it size of land? Is it location of land? Is it, you know, because half an acre in downtown Vancouver is a lot more regionally significant than half an acre in Port Coquitlam. Uh, land values. So, and then my second follow up question to that is so we give this, is Coquitlam willing to, I guess, sign off on the regional, in this portion, sign off on it, on the regional growth strategy, if there's a process to review it after one year. And then at the end of the year, if TAC or the board couldn't come to an agreement on the definition, then we try, but we move on, and therefore the, a definition of regionally significant wouldn't be in the plan. Okay. Uh, the only comment uh, that I would make is that uh, we did start turning our mind to creating a definition regionally significant. We, we did have some discussions uh, along that uh, line and our initial discussions were along the lines. Uh, we could maybe define uh, uh, five principles uh, and then if three of the five were met, and it could be a combination because the region does vary, like you say, and so it can't be really precise. Uh, but we did feel that you could come to a definition or a series of definitions if you pass certain thresholds, uh, then that would be significant. Not every creek in every municipality is regionally significant and shouldn't be shown on a regional plan. Uh, if somebody wants to take out Stanley Park from the regional plan, that shouldn't be allowed. Uh, there is a back and forth there and there's some judgment that goes into there. At the end of the day, we didn't put that into our document because we felt that went too far and was stepping on Metro's uh, uh, toes too much in terms of that whole issue and that should be referred to a Metro committee, which we thought was TAC. We had no problem with it being open. No problem considering other kinds of opportunities to come to that. Uh, but that was what we suggested. Uh, but that in itself uh, is, is one piece of our package. It's not the entire package. No, fair enough. I'm not, I could comment on the whole package if you wanted, but I'm trying to narrow it to sort of yeah. one concern that I have. Um, yeah, I would, my suggestion, if I could do that, was you know maybe TAP works on it and it would be reported back to the regional growth strategy on a, every meeting so that we can see that there's actually progress to it and then there could be um, you know, whatever there is, 12 people that sit on that. But I guess my, my, my second part to my question was, uh, is Coquitlam gonna, 
do you want to hold up the whole RGS until that one year process is over? Or would you sign off on the RGS now, knowing that, that there's a process going to occur? And then that's one question. Then the set follow up to that is what if there wasn't an agreement at the end of the day? What if the board collectively couldn't agree to a definition of regionally significant? Our, our suggestion, if you look at it, you know, what we intended was that that would be a separate process and we would not hold up signing up the overall RGS while that went on. We understood that that should happen after. So that issue by itself would not hold up our agreement on, on the RGS. Um, and, and if we went through a process and if it was not successful, that was not going to hold up critical to our overall acceptance. There were some other issues that were more important, but that one was not. Okay, great, thanks. And, and, and essentially, and the backstop to all of those that is this five year is, is this five year review. But if you go through these processes and at the end of five years uh, you have the review, and then you can start to see, well, okay, it didn't work. Maybe there is a process that we, we can come to some agreement on, agreement on that. But I, I absolutely believe that the, the the minds at the table could come up if they all wanted to could come up to a definition that that makes sense in every community uh, because the current lack of a definition doesn't make sense in. in in Metro Vancouver, and it may well make sense in every community because it allows complete inconsistency, right? Prefer, and you, you spoke to the idea that consistency is a hallmark of this kind of a plan. And I'll just close, I'm not going to debate that, and I think that's great, uh, but just you, you brought the, triggered me on the five-year thing. Yep. Um, from a smaller municipality, uh, I have no problem putting my faith in this board, actually. Uh, I don't need it to be an automatic five years. I don't, I understand where you're coming from, May. Um, and I haven't been around this board as, as long as others have, um, but I've seen even when, you know, Richard, you talked about our little industrial change uh, that we made. Uh, at the committee, it got a lot of discussion, um, but we were able to address those questions and it went through the board almost you know, unanimously. So um, I'm not overly concerned with that has to be there. I'm comfortable with that uh, we have to consider it every five years and hit a, and hit a majority at that, or two-thirds majority at that point to do the review. So. There's really, that's just a comment. Okay, so uh, moving on then. I think that's over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's been said a few times today, but um, in, in the um, brief or in the book that we've got, dated June the 1st, um, and it has been mentioned, it, Coquitlam says that um, they'd like all municipalities to take a sober second look at, at this. And um, I guess the question I would have of Coquitlam is the many, many hours that all the council spent on looking over this region of growth strategy, were they all drunk and didn't know what they were doing by voting in favor of this? Because every council has spent many, many hours going over this with their own staff, with the staff of Metro Vancouver, and I don't want to pull the rug out from underneath Daryl's feet, but Langley City is smaller than North Vancouver. We're four square miles. And we voted in favor of the regional growth plan. And I, I don't see Belcara here. I don't see Anmore here. I don't see White Rock here. I don't see the First Nations here, who are all smaller municipalities than even Langley City. And the facilitator said that Coquitlam wants to wear the regional hat for a better regional plan. Well, if this plan was not what the smaller municipalities that you want to protect, if this is not what they wanted, why did they vote in favor of it? I mean, we as a small council, small city, spent hours. And I have to say that when, when the plan was first brought out, we didn't agree with a lot of it. Our staff negotiated with Metro Vancouver and we came to a compromise. We did not get everything that we wanted, and Metro didn't get everything they wanted. But when, in my opinion, you sit at a regional board, you have to compromise. You may not like it 100%, but you have to compromise. So what we have here is one municipality holding this up. And I understand that you have concerns, but it seems to me that the concerns, what you said in your brief was that the concerns you had in your community as far as land use and that goes, they were all settled prior, prior to this being put out. 
you're opposed to the policy. And again, um, when you have all these people sitting around the board, are you going to be totally happy with the whole policy? Maybe not. But you have to look at compromise. At the last meeting, um, I handed out a brief from uh, comments from our, our staff at Langley City, and it, was, it wasn't formal or anything like that, and they were very concerned, but <clears throat> they address the proposals that Coquitlam want and then comment on those proposals. And to me, this is, is, um, is very brief, and, it's, and it makes a lot of sense. And in regards to the, the regional significance, what they're saying is that it, regional significance changes over time, depending <coughs> on the valid values and the challenges of the day. In the Liverpool Region Strategy Plan, ground orientated was the thing to go with. Now it's not so important. So again, I think it does depend on the time and what's happening in your community, whether something is regional significant or not. And I would hope, and I'm here, I think we're all here, to come to some kind of a conclusion on this and get this plan started. And if it is indeed the policy that you're not happy with, that, that really, the plan you've agreed to in your community, it's a little things outside of that. So as a small municipality, um, I guess I don't need Coquitlam or any other community looking out for us. We can look out for ourselves, as I'm sure other small communities can. And I um, have to say that we were all sober when we made the decision. So whether we took first look, a second look, or a third look, we, we knew what we were doing and we voted in favor of that. So I, I just hope that um, Coquitlam could maybe themselves have a second look at this and, and how far they want to continue with, with this whole process. Thank you. I know there wasn't direct questions embedded in there, but there was suggestions, uh, considerations. Anybody want to respond or do we move on? We hereby withdraw the word sober. Uh, we, we, in fact, I'm looking at it now. I don't remember having read that phrase because uh, the, the goal was to have the region have a look at it again not to have all the municipalities reconsider the mistake they made. That wasn't, certainly wasn't the intent. I thought everyone would attribute that to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to say that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I will say, being a member of the Intergovernmental Committee plus the Regional Planning Committee, I sort of concur with all of the remarks. And of course, when you come towards the end, um, several things have been stated, and, and I think they're important points. Um, I will say I've been around for a long time, almost 22 years, and I was involved in the beginning of the Liverpool uh, region uh, strategy. And one thing that was very disappointing for me as a city councillor over my terms, as I watched uh, our city grow and several other cities grow and change, was the fact that that plan didn't have any teeth. And that was always my frustration, and I was often expressing that um, to Mr. Carline in the fact that there really was not much legislative authority. Uh, so we did see the erosion of industrial land in a number of cities that moved to residential because it was far more lucrative for the development industry to build at that time when the market was hot. We saw the sprawl in the city of Surrey. A lot of areas opened up, so it actually detracted for us to be able to really develop our second metropolitan city around, around the SkyTrain, et cetera, as should be and as sort of directed in that plan. So as a city councillor, I'm really pleased uh, with this new uh, regional plan because I think it does have a bit more teeth in it and I, I do think it has uh, certainly has the support of our council because we did look at it as a regional plan, not just from where we were coming at. And we had some basic concerns on the fact that you know most of the industrial land left in Metro Vancouver is in the city of Surrey and a couple of other places because it's been eroded in Vancouver and in Burnham and Richmond and other places and uh, so as not to have to take in all of that uh, as straight industrial we did negotiate some mixed employment definitions and that came after some strong representation on TAC um, with our planning department and from council members at the board. Second of all I would say as a board member at the regional level in the early 90s and now in the 200s because <laughs> I was off for 10 years I always saw the board as really looking at the amendments or the issues as coming forward as being fair. 
I've never seen our city take a stand against the smaller cities. And I think, if anything, we've been more open to looking at things that people felt needed to be changed in a very serious way. And I think that will continue to happen. If 16 small cities come forward after five years when we're considering a review of the plan, I think that we're open to having a really full discussion about why that's necessary and looking at a review of the plan, whether it would be a major review or a minor review. And that would depend on the details that are moving forward. So I, I just want to say that to maybe alleviate the fear between the big cities and the little cities because I don't really think that's there. In, in my opinion, and uh, that's important for me to state that. I also know that we all have official community plans in our cities, and those are continually <laughs> uh, eroded to some respect or amended amendments brought forward because times do change and uh, pressures in cities to grow change and amendments are brought forward uh, through applications by the development industry and sometimes by city councils to look for a change. And those amendments are then considered by council and then changed in the official community plan because every time we have a development that comes forward that doesn't meet our official community plan, that has to come forward as well as the zoning. And I really look at this regional plan as the ability to do that too. Anyone can bring an amendment forward as I read this plan and with 50% plus one of the vote, those amendments can be um, detailed in the plan and supported by the board. And I think we've seen that in the past. Um, there I remember an amendment came forward from Richmond, uh, close to the Silver City lands, and was fully discussed, and a decision was made on those lands. So I think that there are those opportunities for minor, minor amendments to come forward, and if they're major amendments, that the board will deal with them in a, in a very honest and straightforward way, and decide whether it's going to really jeopardize the plan that we have all agreed to. And you know, I think that is, Coquitlam sees them representing regional interests. We looked at this plan from a regional perspective, because if anything south of the Fraser, what happens uh, on the other side of the river really affects us on south of the Fraser as well. And we have to look at things strategically because we're sort of building our city from the ground up. So uh, we did take a look at that. So to feel that uh, we haven't taken that regional perspective and really looked at the plan from that um, viewpoint, I think is incorrect. But what, what I do hear is that I want to be clear, if we're looking at resolving some of these issues, really what you uh, see as something that has to be an amendment to the plan or what can be uh, adjusted outside of the plan and you go ahead and support the plan. So I heard, if I'm clear, that you said that we could look at the definition of consistency and regional significance um, through a process over the next year, maybe through the planning TAC committee and come forward with some discussion after a year whether we should be considering, quote, an amendment to have something included. And if that's correct, I'd like to hear that from you. I, I'm a bit confused on your stand on consistency because I also hear you want your independence as a council. So it seems to me that a lot of us negotiated parts of this plan um, because we were worried about the word consistency, uh, because we do have our own official community plans and we're putting our regional contact statements together. So it seems to me it's very <coughs> difficult to hold some independence and also comply to consistency uh, with the definition from all the cities. And I think actually that's why it wasn't included in the plan, and I was wondering if you could answer that question. Okay, well, there's about eight questions there. One of them is, yes, we, we think there are other processes that certain questions could be directed to. So could you tell me what those I, are? Not right now. I, oh, okay. I, I don't, I think the answer is probably about an hour long because there are, there are I think there are processes that we could put other, uh, some of these to, and I'm fine with considering whether or not an individual, one of these concerns can be referred to a process, um, keeping in mind that some of these, I think we, we, did, we do need a resolution of them. Um, in the same way though, that and, and I, the, I'm not sure it's been, I'm not going to characterize it as being mischaracterized, but our, we're not trying to wear the regional hat. We had some concerns that are regional in nature. And we had some concerns that were local in nature and they got resolved. The concerns that were regional in nature in the same way if, that if Surrey had the same concern that was regional in nature, that doesn't mean it needs to be dismissed. It mean, mean, means that it's just as valid and it needs to be addressed. And um, our concerns that are regional in nature, but we're not also trying to imply that other municipalities, that any particular municipality didn't even consider it, or that they, they, they didn't give it a close enough look at the plan. 
Uh, our perspective uh, may be a little bit different in that we did have um, a member of our planning staff that was deeply involved in this and got to examine uh, the way in which this unfolded in various municipalities, whereas most municipalities, I suspect, got to examine how it unfolded in their own community and not so much in the other communities. So maybe our perspective is a bit broader because of the way it was structured. But in any case, we have some concerns that are regional, and, I, and I'm pleased to hear those members that have said, Let, let's try to work on identifying how we can resolve them, because this, just dismissing them isn't going to work. Um, it, it, we, need to, we need to sit down and try to work out how to resolve them. And I think that what will come out of it is a better plan. I think that everyone will agree when we're done here that we have a better plan. I, don't, I, I really don't believe that anyone's going to per perceive that we've weakened the plan in any way. Um, with all due respect, I'm just trying to, Richard, sitting here after all this time, be really clear on what you feel actually has to be resolved at this point before you'll support the plan in good faith. And what you feel can be resolved in processes outside of um, this resolution for you to move forward and support the plan, feeling confident that those other issues could be resolved outside of it. And for me, I, I need that clarity in order for us to feel we can move forward to resolve the issues. Well, I, right, right now, we haven't heard any any discussion of the real, the, the, the meat of our objections. We've heard lots of discussions about our proposals. <coughs> I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know that we've actually, uh, I'm perfectly prepared to let's sit down. We could, we could call and figure out whether we can resubmit a, a list that says, well, here's how we can do this, and here's how we can do this one. Um, but I'm, I, I'm just as interested in hearing uh, suggestions from the other side as to how we might be able to get past this. Um, because and that's what you were going to do. <laughs> and, yeah, because we, yeah, we had heard that that was going to happen. I, I just think that will help move it, move it forward. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see us resolve this before we have to go to binding arbitration, because I think then it's out of both of our hands. Uh, so if we can really look at some practical ways that could be resolved, <coughs> because as been stated, you know, 23 other 24 municipalities have looked at it from a city's point of view and also from a regional point of view and do support it. So I, I think it's really incumbent upon us to see how we can resolve it so we can uh, bring support to this plan as we move into the fall. Absolutely. Judy, your yes. chair asked us to listen to all yes. of you, and then yeah. he had things to bring forward, so that's what we're waiting for. Okay. Yeah, so we do need to preserve time to get there, but I don't think this is helpful, and we've got a number of people to go around, but I assume we have to preserve time for those those deliberations and those possibilities to be raised at this table and considered, and maybe there are some real possibilities. I'm, I'm certainly hopeful there are. are we, can we just keep rolling, or people need five minutes? No, just keep, keep at it? Okay, let's just keep going then. Thank you very much. Um, I have to actually run in a few minutes to another meeting, but I know our staff from uh, the city of Vancouver are uh, wanting to follow up questions uh, specifically. It's on. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's on. Turn yours on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. As soon as it turns red, you're in shape there. Wow. All right. You have power. You're live. <laughs> so, uh, I was saying I, I have to run uh, very shortly, actually. So uh, some of our staff from Vancouver are here and want to ask uh, some specific questions. But I uh, want to start off by saying that uh, the city of Vancouver is both um, uh, very uh, pleased uh, with uh, the uh, uh, strategy and uh, we are also very disappointed where we are uh, today. We had. Um, of course, uh, Andrea Reimer, Councillor Andrea Reimer, on the committee, and she has reported that it was uh, very difficult uh, at times, and we've had a lot of give and take, and uh, she is uh, somewhat uh, taken aback that we're also in this situation, which, again, I'll reiterate, I guess, uh, others have uh, to an enormous uh, amount of cost. Uh, I mean, we have many mayors here, and councillors, and, um, and uh, staff, and so this is... Uh, costing us all um, a great deal, so hopefully uh, we'll, um, we'll get through, through this to the end. Um, I'd also uh, like to say that um, uh, the uh, facilitator at one point stated, um, I, 
that we need to say, I start here and you start there, and then we kind of meet some, somewhere. And I, I don't think we're in that same position. There's 23 of us, so the weight of this, I start here, I think is much uh, different than the weight of, uh, of, of equipment who, who are starting in a, a place where we've all uh, had our councils uh, sign off on this and, and study it and uh, feel we've uh, looked at it both uh, regionally as well as our own um, cities. And so we uh, enter into this in a, in a, in a, a very uh, uh, different place. But Coquitlam has also uh, intimated that um, that uh, they are fearful, I think, that they're going to get beat up on by the cities of Vancouver and Surrey and so on, the bigger cities, and therefore need protection. But I would suggest that's never happened uh, in, uh, in uh, the Metro Board. I don't know of one instance that that's uh, ever happened in the Metro Board. Maybe others have, but I've asked uh, some uh, of the other mayors, and they can't think of uh, that ever happening. Uh, and in fact, um, I think that uh, we, um, we bend over backwards. We have more of a problem with each other uh, and uh, have uh, disagreements than I think uh, has uh, occurred uh, with the smaller um, uh, communities. So uh, as far as the um, one-third uh, vote, I, I don't think it would even be in, interest, in the interest of uh, Coquitlam. Uh, uh, personally, uh, I think that <laughs> That's allowing a city like Vancouver just to line up with one other city if you're really fearful and uh, uh, pushing uh, our way through. As far as length of time of an agreement, uh, May, I, I've listened to you say several times you would not, um, you know, go into any agreement with a family and so on that they have that length of an agreement. But I'm sure you go into mortgages all the time. Five year terms. I'm sure that you go into uh, mortgages. That, you might change the, the mortgage, uh, but basically you set them for for a long time. And and uh, um, and uh, uh, May, when there was a discussion about uh, uh, why, well, in fact, uh, uh, Councillor Martin said there that she didn't see any issue uh, around uh, small communities and and uh, why would they have voted if they didn't like it? You said, well, that's what you'd like to know. Why why would they have done that? I think it's important to ask them. I, I hear them saying as well as the uh, larger communities, uh, this is a, a good plan for us, this works for us. And we're really uh, concerned about the length of time it's been so far uh, to uh, come into an agreement. And we, uh, we obviously hope that um, we can find a way <clears throat> so that you too will be included. But you need to know you're starting off uh, with uh, all of us waited on, on one side, and all of us unified in that uh, position. Okay, I'll make one, uh, one comment, and that was, we're not trying to delay things. We're trying to find a solution. I mean, uh, and I wouldn't accuse when Andrew, or Councillor Reimer uh, came to the committee back in well, the fall of 2009, and said, we really, we can't be doing, we can't be moving the RGS forward because Vancouver is preparing for the Olympic Games and we're really, we're really pressed with staff, staffing and other issues. And we really did end up putting on the back burner a little bit the RGS because of Vancouver's request. And I, and I think it was supported by the committee because we felt there was some circumstances that you as whole city were having to deal with that were unusual. Um, we're, our, we're hoping that this process of resolving these concerns will be much, much shorter than the delay that occurred, that occurred as a result of that. Um, but I think this one it actually is related to the uh, elements of the legislation that permit and in fact set out this. They don't permit it, they require that everybody sit down and work this out. And, I, and so at the same time as um, I lament the delay, I lament the delays that we've had so far, particularly the delays setting up this process. Um, but let's, let's move forward and, and, and I recognize that 23 of you will, will try to convince us that we're wrong. Um, in the end, we, are pr we feel pretty strongly about uh, certain of these issues we, we feel very, very strongly about. Let's find out where we can come to and let's not work about trying to find, meet halfway or meet 1 23rd of the way or whatever ratio you want. Let's try to find where the right position is because I think on each one of these points, 
if there is absolutely no reason for a group of small municipalities to fear that the Metro would ignore their request for a review, well, if you're going to get a review anyway, why don't we codify it? And let's just make it, make it part of it. Um, if, if, if we're definitely going to resolve these things to the satisfaction of a minority group, and I'm not trying to speak for small municipalities, and I'm not saying that Coquitlam is <coughs> Vancouver will be, or a group will beat up on us. I'm saying right now the structure is that it's possible that this could happen. So if, if it isn't possible for it to happen because everyone will play nicely, um, then let's go to fine. That sounds fine. It sounds like there wouldn't be any reason to object to that. We'll roll ahead here, and my apologies for Ms. Cat. I don't mean anybody's got it to be, to be suggested. There might be some solutions embedded in those, which could be considered. But I think now the um, participating affected local governments who've, who've got people here to speak to some of these issues, um, it's your turn now. And I know there's some staff there. I can only read certain people, and I know there's some elected officials, and I think the, I think the etiquette of protocol is elected officials uh, will begin. I, I believe somebody said Ernie was in the house. Um, <laughs> Is that appropriate? And then we can sort of go person by person. I don't want to offend anybody, break tradition or anybody. Is that okay? Okay, and then we'll go back and go in a line if that's okay. My red light come on. You did? Yeah, you're in. Excellent. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And um, I'm going to address my comments actually to Director Stevenson. Why did, uh, why did Maple Ridge vote for this? And I'm going to come speak from a Maple Ridge perspective for a minute and going through some of the comments that I've heard over the last, um, the last couple of meetings. <clears throat> Maple Ridge is part of a region. We're incredibly supportive of the region. Um, we're supportive of the regional plan. Uh, and we had vigorous discussion, correct, Ms. Pickering, about around the table about um, and from both ends of the spectrum. Um, one of the comments that was made was the, um, the disappointment or the lack of public process or the fact that um, there were not necessarily public meetings or opportunities for the public to participate. Uh, we held two public sessions in Maple Ridge, admitted, uh, hosted by Metro Vancouver, but we also had um, um, 12 to 15 workshop sessions that were public. I appreciate the fact that uh, Mr. Marco and Mr. Carline had attended uh, some of those. Uh, Director Corrigan, as, as chair of the planning committee, came out and helped us work through some of these things. Maple Ridge is a growing community. We've got tremendous growth challenges to manage. Uh, 2.3 to 2.5 percent a year is, is, is how we're growing. We have enough residential land. I'm, I'm convinced to, to take the residential growth. Where we're going to have our challenges is um, getting uh, land for employment or industrial opportunities, and that's where a lot of <clears throat> a lot of the conversation revolved around. How are we going to manage or or um, look after the, the future growth in our community? Um, so uh, again, as far as an, uh, uh, an open process, I think it, it from my community's perspective, it was very open. Lots of opportunities. Um, another one of the, the points that was made was the plan perhaps is, is not as strong as it could be or there were things done to address everybody's concerns. Were all Maple, Ridge cons Maple Ridge's concerns addressed the way we wanted them to be? No. Uh, we sent in, uh, I, I think, close to 27 or 28 uh, comments and concerns uh, to Metro Vancouver and uh, they were all done by council resolution. To, uh, to ensure that, that, that the message got through. Um, again, as I said, we struggled from both ends of the argument. Where we had a large struggle was, to be honest, taking those 12 or 14 Maple Ridge OCP designations and trying to fit them into the five or six Metro Vancouver ones. But, but we did it, and, uh, and, and we struggled with it. Um, Metro Vancouver, um, gave us a, a study area. That's important to, to what's going to happen with the future of our community. We, that was part of what we felt we needed to address as part of the plan. Uh, that was accepted. Um, uh, again, I, I'm going to go back to, to local concerns. I mean, population versus employment. We're changing, we're growing rapidly. Uh, and 
and how this fits into a regional plan that uh, suits Maple Ridge's needs as well as respects um, the region as well. We've got a we've got a great a great region. We need to play our our, our part in it. And that kind of brings me to the amending process. Maple Ridge actually went through an amendment uh, a year or so ago with the Jackson Farm, and we talked about being, was it, is it regionally significant versus locally significant? Maple Ridge worked out, worked really hard to come up with a, what we feel was a, a, a good uh, agreement, a good solution, a good proposal, and, um, and it came to the board actually came twice. I think uh, once it failed and the second time it was, it was successful and very close. I think uh, if a couple of, of uh, board members had voted def differently, it would have failed. And, if, and thank you for that vote, Mayor Stewart. <laughs> uh, looking at the new amending formula, we, we, we are very comfortable with it. Um, we feel that it's, it's fair. We feel that it, it addresses uh, our concerns and we feel that Again, having gone through it, that it, um, it, it will work for us. Um, we have, uh, and again, actually going back to, uh, to the five years or, or how that can be amended, the way I read uh, 6.4, it uh, doesn't matter if you're the littlest guy or the biggest guy, you can bring an amendment forward to the board. Again, my experience, uh, even though being a newbie around the table, uh, that the board has always been very respectful of the item, there, it's it's allowed to come forward. There's vigorous debate, and then whatever the decision, it uh, it, it it can be made. Uh, I won't belabor the uh, the fact of, of looking after regional issues versus uh, local issues, and and again, Maple Ridge Council by resolution brought our concerns, and and with the greatest respect, I feel that Maple Ridge has gone through that, spent uh, an enormous amount of time getting an understanding of the plan, and we feel that, uh, that our local issues have been met. Uh, we're happy with how uh, they've been addressed in the plan. Uh, and everybody's unique. We're very different from some of the more urban communities. We have, with us, uh, ourselves, in the Township of London, we have the vast majority of rural lands uh, in, in the region, and, uh, and that brings unique challenges. Um, as far as staff and the TAC working group, uh, Ms. Pickering was part of that. Um, Maple Ridge Council was regularly updated with the, the progress in that, so um, I, I'm confident uh, that we got the information we needed. Always staff, uh, our staff as well as Metro staff has always been great at, at providing that. And then finally, uh, just to wrap up, we have a couple of councillors that did, uh, uh, again, similar uh, comments to Council Robinson. How do we measure this thing? What, what, is, what does this look like? How do we know if it's going to be a successful plan or not so successful? And again, in the document, there's, I think, 50 some odd measurements um, and, and uh, I think exhaustive in many ways on whether this plan will be a success over the coming years or not. The whole staffing thing, I think that takes, gets taken care of as part of the, the regular kind of global um, budget process. And I guess my, I guess my plea or my, uh, is that, that we do deal with this quickly and, and we come to some sort of resolution. I do not want a third party deciding what's gonna happen for Maple Ridge and or for the region. And, um, and, and I guess uh, going back to my work life for 25 years, spending uh, that in a franchise op uh, life uh, where you've got 70, you think this is difficult? <laughs> Try managing 78 guys that have their wives, dogs, houses, and everything else on the line. And, and what I found around that table at times was that some viewed consensus or compromise as a sign of weakness. I actually view that as a sign of strength because we have a lot more to lose by not figuring it out than we do um, by, by not figuring it out. So uh, those are my, my comments, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, share them. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Appreciate that. I think we'll move on and, and maybe start at the sort of 
over there toward the point. Um, yeah. So good afternoon, Randy Pekarski, City of Vancouver, Planning Department. Um, and I, sh I should start by saying um, I was a member of the TAC uh, working group that uh, that worked on the plan uh, for many hours in, 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 uh, in, in the Metro boardroom, and, and so I, I certainly I feel like I have a, a, a vested interest in, in the plan at a personal level, but I'll start with just to reiterate the, the position that uh, Councillor Stevenson uh, started with. Our council uh, addressed this item seven times in, in council chambers and in, in, in the end supported the RGS um, as, in, its, in its current form. With that, uh, I want to notice that when we did so, we believed that we were, accept we were accepting it and through implementing it, we would learn a lot about implementing it by doing the implementation. And so I think that part of it was our acceptance that uh, we didn't get every, everything uh, we wanted. Um, no one, no one in, a, in a negotiation does, I think. But we did notice that there was there was a, a learning by doing aspect to the plan, and that was something that we were looking forward to. So, so put that as a, as, a, as a general comment. The other general comment that I'll say is that one of the things that we found was that developing a more regulatory plan is more difficult. And so um, there's been some comments about uh, it taking uh, long or too long or, 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 or those kinds of things. And I, and I, I would just say as, as someone trying to work through the solutions to it on a regulatory basis that um, it does take longer to work out the, the kind of regulations and, it's, and it was a very challenging exercise to come up with, with agreements around the diversity of municipalities with a, with, within, a, within a new regulatory framework. Um, we did that um, with, with noticing that the goal was not to reach 100% consistency or to have 100% uh, acceptance of all of the things. There, there, there was give and take uh, in the process. We certainly uh, um, respect uh, Coquitlam's concerns and insights. Um, I just again make, make the observation that um, the debate the work that we're in right now um, is an important one from the perspective of enabling the plan to act itself out over time at, at, in the event we do get into future dispute resolution processes. So I'll also take this as a learning by doing uh, kind of exercise because we may, we may be at this, uh, this kind of table again. And I think it's an important uh, process for that reason, uh, if none other. Um, in the current process, I think that the face-to-face the, the -face that we're, we're, in, we're in now that uh, that is, 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 re is really good. It's, it's, we, I, I feel that in this discussion, I've learned some more uh, uh, aspects to the plan that, uh, that we, we, we didn't have, because in part, we, we didn't have the inter interaction with the board and, and the various perspectives of the uh, of councils. So with those, uh, those few introductory comments, I'll just go, go on to some, some comments on, on, and questions on the proposals. With, with respect to proposal one, um, this proposal, uh, I, as I see it, is, is kind of a two aspects. One is a reflecting a change of use, and, and another is, is what's the voting threshold. With respect to the to the change of use, um, I guess a comment that we would we would uh, offer is that the proposal one to to make those kinds of changes um, does cut away at the regional significance, particularly of the industrial and mixed employment areas. Um, this would allow considerable considerable more changes than than are, than are currently permitted permitted in the plan. And a challenge or veto system doesn't really seem very compatible with 6.2.7 as it stands right now. So a question for, for Coquitlam is that if, if your proposal were supported, what would be the changes to uh, 6.2.7 A, B, and C? Would you still need those if you were allowed to make the changes that you're describing in your, in your proposal, proposal one? Um, just to go on, uh, again, I, I'll say I, I appreciate the discussion around the voting thresholds and, and we've got various opinions about um, the, the, the weight of, of votes. And then, and, and then looking at the, the and, and, this, and, and I'm, I'm going to trade into ground, uh, to, into ground that, I, that I'm not uh, expert in at all in, in terms of governance and the, and, the, and the norms of governance in Metro, but I will just make the observation that if if we do um, go to uh, a question of the, of the votes, does, the, does Metro or the Local Government Act provide you with an ability to go to a non-weighted vote? And in, and in the course of a non-weighted vote, if you take a look at the kind, the kind of math that you, you've got, it does give you a 50 plus 1 that we, were, we, we talked about last time as, as an important uh, uh, thing, but it would also give some weight to the smaller municipalities in terms of the balance uh, of things. And so I just throw, throw, throw that out as, as a, 
as a, as, a, as again a, a question that uh, that may, maybe Metro um, might, might be able to address. Um, also, just this is a procedural question on the nature of the, because I think that these these proposal one is such a fundamental change to the nature of, of, of the agreement that I have to ask the question about where we are in the approvals process. Uh, so, so for clarification, we've gone through a public hearing. We've gone. Through, we're now in a dispute resolution process, and and, and as I understand it, we're looking for uh, if, if anything gets resolved here, we we'll go back to municipal acceptance. An important question, I guess, if there's substantive changes to the plan, is what's the role for public input into that that process? If there are substantive changes to the to the regional growth strategy, and would there be an opportunity for for the public to address the metro board prior to them here uh, approving any changes that come out of it? Uh, it's because of the uh, proposals in here, are some, uh, in some ways, are, 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 are quite fundamental. Um, Shall, shall I keep well, there's a few. There's at least three questions so far. Uh, at least I've been tracking. Um, so I don't know if people on this side of the table. We should keep going. Just, just get them all. Out get all the questions out. Do you want to? Be, okay. So okay. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move quickly. Is that okay with everybody on this side, or do you do you want to parse them out? No, I'd like to. I'll be quiet. That's amazing. But go ahead. Okay, just all out of the table. Well, <laughs> Councillor Reid will be quiet. We should. We'd encourage him to keep going. <laughs> all right. So, so I'm going to move to um, hold, uh, um, number four because uh, I, I, I felt like it was very, it sort of hinges on, on, on one so closely. The the again, I appreciate the efforts to to clarify what a dispute resolution process uh, might entail. Um, I guess our general belief, as we were going into this, was that there was a dispute resolution process available to any amendment of the RGS or or RCS as per the Local Government Act. Um, again, I'm going to ask the question to see clarification after taking a look at the Act and taking a look at what is now the minor amendment process being introduced by the Regional Growth Strategy, to, just, to, just to get clarity. With, in 857.1 of, of the Local Government Act, it talks about uh, the, the strategy can, can develop an, its own uh, amendment process. It doesn't, it, or I'll say it's, it's ambiguous on whether or not in that amendment process, there is a dispute resolution available. Should 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 you get it, uh, it not approved? So it's so just 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 trying to get uh, does does the current regional growth strategy, with a type three amendment, provide for a dispute resolution process in the event that it doesn't succeed? Uh, and and, and this, is, this is something I just I just uh, don't know. Uh, and, but our belief was, as I said, that we would always have a dispute resolution uh, process available. So, just, so again, that's just a question for clarification. Noticing that, uh, that I do think that the guidelines in 615 that are, that, uh, that are now provided do go a long way to getting to addressing how amendment procedures uh, are, are addressed, and, and, and that's one of the uh, uh, implementation actions that, uh, that the plan offers. Um, the, the, the remaining comments, uh, Proposal 2, um, certainly supports uh, per periodic uh, review, um, but, I, I, but I guess I would just, just suggest that maybe this is better as, as an implementation agreement discussion or, 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 or um, to, if, if, if the question is how to, how, how to trigger the review, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure it needs to be dealt with in the, in the regional growth strategy and maybe it's just something we can parse into an implementation agreement discussion. Um, don't have any don't have any comments on on proposal three. With respect to proposal five, um, Coquitlam uh, suggested that we, we we need to develop a clearer framework, and and I guess I would just say I'm, I'm not clear what the fr what a framework is. Um, in general, uh, our belief was that there's sufficient guidance provided in section D in the intent sections that do provide the guide uh, some guidance of what the framework for for what regionally significant lands are and what should and shouldn't be included. Um, it, it also talks about the reason for doing this is to get greater consistency, and I'll just come back to a comment I made earlier. I don't believe that consistency alone is, is, is the goal. Uh, consistency of outcomes, I think, is, is, is probably what we were more interested in. And so the mapping exercise that, that was used as an example where some, some places put all of their streams, the, protect, the streams they protected in, in the map, uh, others did not. The fact that there is legislation and, 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 and regulations in, in place to protect those streams is, is there in, in whether it's mapped or not. 
And so, so I would just I would just say that you know looking looking at the map for 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 uh, pure consistency isn't sufficient to say that that there's not that because it's not consistency that the plan isn't isn't good enough uh, from from my perspective. Regarding number six, um, I, I would just say that this this number six appears to re result in a higher degree of regional oversight than the plan currently provides for. Uh, we went through a process of trying to get fairly narrow definitions of what should be in every every single designation, and that is a very difficult and challenging thing with 23 or 24 different jurisdictions and different kinds of bylaws in place. Um, it seems that uh, Coquitlam is, is suggesting that it would be moving more more towards a regional land use zoning kind of a, kind of approach, um, and. That one size fits all would be would be a real challenge for the city of Vancouver uh, to to accept, and so I just look look to Kukulam to clarify what exactly you're intending uh, to to accomplish in that, and how you would reconcile all the all the variety of, of, of uh, circumstances across the region. So in closing, uh, I, I guess I would, again I'll say I'll say we would look to improve improve uh, improving clarity through this plan by doing the plan. Um, Implementation uh, is, 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 is a key to, to finding out whether or not this plan, this plan works. Vancouver supports it as it stands. Um, the implementation agreements, uh, as provided for in Section 868, uh, I think are, are an important vehicle for us to, to, to maybe use as a way to get, get us beyond where we are now and move forward. Thanks. May I suggest, before we get into the reply to that, <coughs> We could spend the rest of the afternoon addressing those questions. Many of them are process questions. Not that they're not important. They're nice to know, but, but they're not going to get us to a solution here. So may I suggest that we, uh, uh, well, move on. I mean, have, have those items addressed by you that will move us towards resolution, but other process questions can wait uh, to, you know, for explanation to some other time. And can people decipher in, in the six or seven questions I was tracking the procedural ones and the ones that are more substantive that might again move towards addressing a particular? Yeah. Well, I uh, I concur. Um, uh, throughout this, I, I think sometimes it's better if we can get the questions in advance so that we can actually perhaps provide some indication as to where we might be able to resolve some of the questions or they might lead toward a resolution. I think uh, Mr. Stelman had a couple of comments in that regard. Yeah. I could uh, I could respond to almost all those questions, but I don't think it's um, it would take too much time in terms of what we've got, and that time is better utilized in other areas. Um, suffice it to say, we have thought about a number of those issues, and uh, and we do have answers to them. But it's probably better that we just give them in writing, and then people can see them. And I would encourage others if they have detailed questions like that to give them to us in writing, and we'll then we can deal with it more effectively in that matter. If, if the committee wants me to give answers, I, I do have some answers that I give, but I think the time is better spent in another way. With, uh, with, with respect to the majority of the room, of course, being elected officials and having, having several planners going on for some time, uh, I, I also suspect that some of the answers that Randy is raising may be subject to different interpretations, and it might be appropriate that maybe both Chris and I uh, uh, try to take our own perspectives uh, in answering, in, in fairness to the process, but to everyone's point, off, offline with the system, if that's all right. Okay, and it's going to be tempting to get into some of those procedural questions, but again, in, in the best interest of use of your time, if they could be substantive to the greatest degree possible, that move towards particular proposals and possibilities, questions, comments, suggestions, um, we'll see if we can, we can do that the best we can. It's hard to get off the technical procedural stuff, but well, in fact, a lot of it will be really important, so please, um, if you don't include them here in your verbal comments, send them to us so we can, we can staff can interpret them and figure out whether they help in, in solving the problem. <coughs> Thank you. Next, please. Am I on? Yes. Uh, Don Limus, uh, City of Surrey staff. Um, I'll keep my comments really brief, and they do end with a question. I, I don't know if this is a procedural question or a substantive question. We'll get to that when we get to it. Um, I think Councillor Villeneuve has, has already spoken quite strongly about um, uh, Surrey's perspective. I think it's fair to say that during the development of the RTS, the City of Surrey shared some of the concerns that the City of Coquitlam has expressed uh, regarding a balance between local land use decision making and regional interest. And I think a number of other municipalities also had some concerns at that point. 
Uh, through the summer of last year, um, staff from around the region worked to revise earlier drafts of the RTS, and what came out at the, uh, the end of that process was a plan that was unanimously accepted by Surrey City Council, and so that's our, our starting point. Um, is it the only plan, the only particular plan, line for line, that would have been accepted by Surrey City Council? Probably not. Is it an absolutely perfect plan from Surrey's perspective? Probably not. Um, and I think the spirit behind some of the proposals put forward by Coquitlam um, is, is understood and appreciated by, by the City of Surrey. Um, but I guess it's fair to say that Surrey is choosing to trust in the collective, collaborative approach um, with other local governments to ensure that there's that shared regional interests are appropriately balanced with, with local interests. Metro is not, from our perspective, a foreign beast. It's, in fact, us. We are Metro, and Metro is us um, as a collective, as a regional collective. Um, our council believes that this regional growth strategy provides an appropriate platform for that um, continued cooperation and, and even a forum for, for resolving disputes and disagreements. I think of Coquitlam's proposals, the one that um, stresses the importance of regular timely review of the plan um, is, is perhaps the most significant, maybe the most interesting uh, from our perspective. And uh, this gives the region a chance to fully discuss mid-course corrections on a, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. You know, for example, some issues that are pressing now, and maybe more pressing five years from now, whether it's uh, issues raised by groups outside of this table, um, affordability of, of housing is a huge issue. Um, economic development and ensuring wealth creation and uh, adequate land for employment is, is incredibly significant and is likely to be more significant in, in five or ten years. And so a way of, of ensuring mid-course corrections as appropriate is important. So um, Surrey recognizes that the legislation already provides for a review mechanism by the Metro Board, um, but understands Coquitlam's desire to, I guess, raise the profile or, or entrench or, or in some way um, ensure the serious reconsideration of a plan at five-year intervals or some other interval and understands and appreciates that, that concern. Um, for the City of Surrey, it's not a deal-breaker, um, and I'll reiterate that Surrey's Council has unanimously accepted the RTS as it is and understands that the legislation does obligate the Metro Board to, to review the, uh, um, uh, and consider the review of the plan on a regular basis. So I'll lead to my question, I guess, and that is, does Coquitlam see an acceptable way of raising the profile or ensuring the seriousness of reconsideration of the plan? Does Coquitlam see a way of doing that um, from outside of the plan, outside of the plan, not requiring the re-ratification of a somewhat slightly amended plan by 24, 25, whatever, local governments? So does Coquitlam see a way forward? And I don't know if that's a procedural question or a substantive one. And I'll, I'll stop my comments at that point. Yeah, it's probably, probably uh, we'll, we'll take it on notice of it and we'll, we'll contemplate that. This is actually, we'd have to probably put forward that this is our most important perspective because uh, the, the, the concept of 30 years without the possibility, or with the possibility that, that some might not be able to yeah. achieve that kind of review. So, so I, uh, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, that, that's our biggest issue. Um, can we do it? Could it be done outside of the uh, an RGS amendment? Um, I don't know. Bruce is brilliant, but I don't know if he's that I think I think one of the issues that, that sort of is, is implicit or tapped into my response on is what is the degree of robustness or rigor around the consideration to review question? Um, th th there's absolutely no documentation or suggestion on that as it sits now, other than as been suggested by members that a member of the committee can bring it forward or um, Metro staff can bring it forward in fifth to consider a review. But outside of that statement, there's really no rigor, there's no structure, there's no criteria minimum to what does that consideration take into input in, into the question that it would ask Metro, is this the time to review? And I guess that would be part of one of the things we'd like to understand if there's a kind of proposal, which I did hear, I did hear uh, Director Brody reference, there would be. And I guess that would be something we could try to understand in reference to that answer. Can I, can I ask can I add one thing that I, I forgot to say, and it's, it's regarding, um, I think there's been some discussion uh, about alignment and voting blocks, and, that, and, and I guess I just want to assure everyone that, you know, Surrey's interests are not always aligned with the same group of municipalities, you know, and, and 
And, you know, we we're, were part of the, the livability accord uh, with Coquitlam and Township of Langley and the city of Abbotsford. We, I think on transit issues, we align with municipalities south of Fraser, big and small, um, fighting for our share of regional transit. On other issues, we might align with, with municipalities that are larger. And, and so I think that, you know, I guess just assurance to Coquitlam that Surrey's interests don't always align in a block. And, and so some of the concerns around big versus small, um, while I, I appreciate the concern, um, are, not, are not something that Surrey um, uh, is, uh, is interested in, in. You know, we're not interested in participating in a, a coalition of the big. I just mean, assure you of that. And I, I, maybe this is stating the obvious. I think it's important to recognize that this is highest, seems to be highest priority on the side of the table. The question was, what alternatives might might exist to fulfill the concern embedded in that proposal outside of an RGS? And I overheard, you know, somebody said, any any member of the, any of the 24 can bring this forward. And Bruce's response is, well, what what? How do you would consider that? What would be the criteria? How how do we ensure it's given careful consideration? And I think some people say the board would just do that because they do it in their wisdom. Um, but I think that's part of it, and I don't know if that begins to point you in a direction. And I'm not hinting at content, I'm but just saying, I don't, I don't know, Bruce, if you're moving in a direction I don't there. want to cut off this agenda. I, I distinctly heard uh, uh, Mayor Brody suggest that in due course, he would bring that forward, whether we love that or want to talk I, about that. So, I'm, I, I don't want to get your hopes up, but I, no, I, have a I, I don't want to cut off your time. I mean, this voting mandate is, we've already indicated how unacceptable. On. To reduce anything below 50 percent, are, are we suggesting we we want to move to those proposals now? I don't think so, but I think um, there is going to be a time and place. May was just about to pipe in, I think. But Malcolm's looking at me, so I won't. We'll wait till should, we get finished. Okay. Here. Yeah, we should. Let, let's we will. We will get finished. If that's going to work, Malcolm, would you join us at our council meeting? Okay, um, oh, we will continue, but I think you're beginning to hopefully move in directions of where, where might this go outside, and that was the question. So we'll, we'll pause there, and then we'll keep going, and then take a quick break, and then maybe have some proposals or responses on the table. I'm uh, Terry Crow, the Manager of Policy Planning for the City of Richmond. I've been here since we started the review. Um, I would like to talk about, make some comments about process and some observations perhaps about the results. I do not have a question at the end. I think with the 96 LRSP, um, it's vague. It, the roles of who is going to implement and do what isn't clear. The interests are too vague and it's very hard to amend. Pretty well all 24 have to get involved and so on. So we started rewriting this, and uh, a year ago, the draft plan, which I think one would say would be uh, regionally rigorous, uh, thinking of industrial lands and designations, none of us would approve it. None of us would at all. So what we did on process last summer was <coughs> uh, the TAC colleagues and Metro Van staff sat down, sometimes in this room, sometimes upstairs, and we rewrote every word in that plan. We put it up on the whiteboard. And the first thing was, do we need this phrase at all? And a lot of things were taken out. And on every line, and I mean every line, it was, do we need it? Can we edit it? Can we delete it? And we even had a re-undelete phrase about back in and forth. In that effort, all municipalities' interests were respected, were heard. We did not leave the table if somebody was unhappy, because if they were unhappy, they'd go back to their council and say they were unhappy, and then it wouldn't get the result in a 24 municipal uh, approval at the end. We spent two days alone, that's a whole bunch of planners, and 18 hours, or 16 on industrial definition and mixed employment, because that was the new thing that came out of the, you know, the, the general or the urban category. <clears throat> and I recall one day that uh, we're about to leave, it was five to five, and we're, some of us were almost out the door, and one of the municipalities, this one day I have in mind was Burnaby, we had all said, yeah, we're happy with a certain clause, and Burnaby wasn't, and we sat down again and did not leave until there was a word or a tweaking of that phrase. And that happened all summer. 
And the result of that was that uh, I learned a lot. Uh, as earlier colleagues said, um, we had to, uh, at some point, call it and say, Christine will re rephrase it because we all want to edit our own way and fine. What helped also was that, for the first time, in each chapter you have what are Metro Van's interests, local interests, and other interests. And we think that as the plan is written, which, are, which I'll get to in a minute about definitions and policies, and importantly, as it will evolve, evolve there is a lot of flexibility. And I think that if, uh, since we went with a harder, let's say, regional approach a year ago, if you have to go on the plan, is it more or less regional or local? I'd say it's like 51%, a little more to the local interest, because you need 24 of us to approve this thing. So how are our interests protected? Well, in the definitions. You will find very few definitions which say it is intended that industrial uses mean. And the reason for that is there's flexibility on how it's applied. And you need, we need that. And that's for all the categories. <clears throat> the policies are written down and uh, they're, they're identified per interest, what Metro Van does, what each of us will do. As it's proposed, our interests are defined in the current regional growth strategy maps as they might be amended and during periodic reviews. But the big one is that all this will, uh, the, the real balance and local autonomy will come when we do our new regional context statements. And I think we only have one done now in North Van. And all of us will have a lot of flexibility and choose the, um, to, we're going to work in an, in Richmond, conservation, recreation, industrial, all those uses, manage urban growth, transit, and so on. But we get to decide, and everybody does, and we all agreed on how that is applied. If you look at any, in the growth strategy, the different sections of what we have to put in, each of us, on any topic, you, you, you hear the words like, you will support something. The, the municipality will indicate how it's going to do something. The municipality will encourage how it's going to be done. So there's a lot of flexibility there because how exactly in Maple Ridge, what quarter section or, or what little bit of land you put, industrial or residential, we don't really care at the fine strokes. As to the results of that balance, you really have five types of decisions here. You have type one, where everybody has to get involved, two and three. But you have type four, which is the one that says, if you're gonna modify in the urban area, uh, a set, an area or a, change the designations less than a hectare, you don't go to the board at all. And the fifth one is, and the default position is, if the growth strategy doesn't say it, you don't have to go to the board at all. So there's really five sets of, um, uh, ways we make decisions, which are a far cry from the two we have right now. And in a way that we did talk about regionally significant through the summer. And one could say, well, regionally significant means industrial uses are regionally significant in the region. And we kind of got that. But then the issue was, well, how does that apply itself and who's going to do what? And I suggest that the, the work we spent in the summer about how that applies and the flexibility we all get does achieve that. It really won't get uh, a balance, a much better balance, perhaps, or uh, it is suggested, between regionally different local and local autonomy and regional issues than we have now. So on that basis, I, uh, Richmond, uh, and we looked at it eight times, uh, approved the strategy. We just have a couple of map changes totally after. But that was the context that we've, where we're coming from with the 96 plan, where we were a year ago, and what we have now with the flexibility that, that we need. And on every chapter, Richmond, and I think most municipalities support it, it's regionally significant to do something more about industrial and mixed use and so on. Some of the details about how it hits the geography in our own municipalities, that's where you want flexibility. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there's a... No? Um, I think we'll just continue to move on. Or... Yeah. 
let's keep uh, okay. going. Okay, a couple of left, and then take a big, very quick break, and then response perhaps to certain proposals, and see where that gets you. Jean, I don't know, Jane, Jane, and then Greg. Thank you. We get a, a twofer. Huh? Good deal. Maple Ridge gets a twofer. That's that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm really not going to say very much. Um, I think Mayor Dakin has covered off a lot of um, uh, what the input we wanted to provide today um, for uh, this particular thing. The one thing I, I would like to say, though, is uh, um, I have worked in this region a very long time, and I have chaired the TAC committee, and I've been a member of it for many, many years. And um, one of the basic principles that I have found that speaks very strongly across this region is that we all value its diversity. Very strongly we all value its diversity. And uh, we work hard to ensure that there is diversity that thrives in this region. Maple Ridge is not the same as Richmond. Richmond is not the same as Port Moody. Port Moody is not the same as Coquitlam, even though they be neighbors. And we have worked very hard to um, ensure that that lives in the region and it lives in this regional plan. Um, so one of the things I am a, a tad confused over is the, um, and perhaps it's a question for Coquitlam, is the stand on consistency because nobody feels things should be more consistent across this region than me. I don't think that Maple Ridge's uh, situation should be treated any differently than anybody else's. Um, and yet, I struggle with the fact that we are not all the same and that we encourage diversity. So. I struggle a bit with the need for this, uh, what I see as a, um, cons extreme consistency everywhere, 100% consistency, and yet being able to appreciate diversity and allow that diversity to thrive, because I believe that that is a very strong principle across this region, as I've said. So just a, a, a question, I think, for Coquitlam, and, and just a bit of a comment, I'm not going to say more than my colleagues have said, but I would like to say that at the TAC level, um, what Terry talked about, the meetings that we had about uh, rewriting the plan were, were very true. We worked very hard to make sure everybody's issues were dealt with. And one of the, the measures that we had very strongly was regional significance. I remember there a member from Vancouver came uh, to one of those meetings and said we need to measure this all against regional significance, against local significance. And believe me, that was a discussion that went on for many, many meetings. And we argued about it, and we measured it, and we talked about it, and, and, uh, and I feel that regional significance was very much built into this plan, that we were not wanting the region to go places where local government should be, and, uh, and vice versa. So um, again, I guess that's a bit of a question for Coquitlam. Where do they see that regional significance is not really built into this? Because I know at the working level, maybe, uh, well, I don't, I don't even think at the political level that was debated so much. I think our council uh, went back and forth about that as well and came to the resolve that they were satisfied that the region was staying at the area of the regional significance and municipal government was staying at the level of local significance. And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. So if I could just answer very quickly the, the, the both questions. The, the regional significance, I'll wrap into the question of consistency because I think it, it quite comes down to a question of what each municipality considered regionally significant. Uh, and, and that actually, what and I described in an earlier meeting how that played out related to the definition of parks and regional significance in various communities. As far as the uh, consistency, we're not striving for 100%, we're not striving for 50% consistency, we're not striving for any measure of consistency, other than what how that came about was when we were dealing with one of our golf courses and we were trying to determine uh, how you designate a golf course. And so we looked around the region and there was no consistency whatsoever as to what a golf course looks like, because some of them are designated agriculture, some of them designated urban, some of them designated, um, I don't think any of them are designated industrial, but maybe. Um, and we have, uh, and, and conservation recreation, we had actually suggested at one point uh, that perhaps another designation ought to come out of that, and that would be an intensive recreation uh, sort of a, a zone that would allow golf courses and recreation areas, because our, and we have some ball diamonds that are partly called conservation areas and, you, and so how do you define a, a ball diamond as conservation and um, and so that was the challenge with, with uh, consistency was is it possible to structure this so that everyone has a, a measure of, of where a golf course ought to be and there's a number of other examples I don't want to go into them now but it wasn't meant that everybody has exactly the same um, 
the determination of every aspect of the plan, but rather that we can strive in future, not so much going back to try to fix this one either, but strive in future for greater consistency rather than lesser and lesser consistency as we go forward. Okay, <coughs> okay thanks, TransLink2. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Greg Yeomans. I'm the manager of transport and land use at TransLink. And like some of my colleagues around the table, I've been involved in the LRSP review since, since it started, although most, most of the time I wasn't at TransLink. In fact, I was mostly here. Um, like many of the, if not all, member municipalities, the, the TransLink board uh, considered the growth strategy on several occasions. Wrote lots of letters uh, to the Metro board. It was part of the working group that met uh, last summer. And uh, we certainly had endless conversations with Metro staff to talk about specific issues. Now, I'm at the end of the line here, so I'm, it's fortunate to some degree that most of the uh, notes that I've made have already been dealt with. The questions I might have asked have been answered, so most of my comments are, have been crossed out. So what I'd like to do now is just highlight uh, one key issue, I think, uh, that, that's of interest to TransLink, and it relates to the first proposal, proposal number one. Uh, for context, one of the criticisms of, of the Little Region Plan focused on the, the, the balance it struck between the regional vision and the ability of the board to manage its implementation. As we all know, the Little Region Plan was a high-level policy document, mainly gave uh, broad directions on how the region should manage growth. And other than the Green Zone boundary, it really didn't uh, provide much clarity on how the region should work together to implement it. On the other hand, as everybody knows, plan was really hard to change and you needed effectively consensus on amendments and as we've seen now uh, it's really hard to create a new plan in the amendment process. It's time consuming, technically difficult and clearly risky. Uh, the proposed RGS strikes a really different balance uh, from uh, the LRSP between its vision and how it would be implemented. In essence, while it's a much more detailed plan in defining its vision and the roles of the folks to implement it, uh, unlike the LRSP, it, it's much, much easier to amend. And all but a few issues uh, no longer would need uh, unanimity or consensus to, to make change. In fact, the ease with which the, the plan could be amended relative to the LRSP was one of those core objectives that we all discussed last uh, summer to make the plan a living document for the board. Uh, one of the issues flagged along the way, though, as, as we tried to build that into the plan, was whether the effort to make it easier for the board to amend it would compromise its clarity or its value as a strategic planning document. And that brings uh, me back to Proposal 1. Uh, proposal 1 is all about flexibility, and that's something the TransLink uh, certainly argued for uh, during the development of the plan, as did others. That said, if the plan was amended to allow any amount of land uh, within the containment boundary to be redesignated at any time, uh, in any way, albeit with a negative voting option for the board, uh, we see that there would be a risk of that diluting all the gains you get from the new plan uh, and reduce some of the clarity that the new uh, vision that we've all agreed to, uh, we reduce the clarity of that vision in, in the resulting document. For agencies like TransLink, this could reduce the plan's value as an instrument to guide uh, our strategic planning efforts, prioritizing infrastructure and the development of investment plans since we really wouldn't know what the general land use designations and categories in the plan would be, whether they'd be there uh, in a year or even a month hence, since they can be amended uh, at any scale at any time. In a way, the land use designations themselves may uh, no longer have much value um, under this scenario, and as I think uh, noted by some earlier, it's the designations that are at the core of the plan. <coughs> so we feel that the desire for flexibility in the growth strategy makes a lot of sense, uh, and there may be a need to refine uh, the plan in the near future, if we can find a way to do that, to make sure that its provisions for flexibility meet uh, the test uh, of implementation but we'd be uh, very concerned that that flexibility would come at the expense of the fundamentals of the plan. So what I think we would uh, like to hear from through this process uh, would be practical solutions to respond to the principle of not introducing flexibility at the risk 
of what the plan's trying to achieve uh, and allow the plan to move ahead because we, we want it to move ahead. So thank you. That's a negotiation salvo in my, in my uh, s sphere. So um, there's been questions, comments, suggestions, in directions to take. I don't. I think probably people need a bit of a break to just sort of refresh, and then I think we're going to get back. I'd like to get back for ten minutes if I can keep up a nice quick break. I, I think people, specifically, what time will we? Start? We will be specifically. I'm just looking at that clock on the wall, so I think we have to be sit down, ready to go at quarter two, not a moment later. So, and I think the this expectation is there'll be an opportunity for Metro to share suggestions, proposals, ideas. Um, I'm reading with respect to proposals three, five, and six okay. at this point. Could, could I ask that we combine this with a, a short opportunity for us to have a conversation and make it 10 minutes to instead? Uh, we have to return here at 10 minutes to rather Okay, than so a bit of a, bit of a, okay, so we'll have a, otherwise we get no break. All right, so 15 minute break. Okay. 15 minute break specifically. Back here at 10 to, thank you. you need to describe how this is going to happen, but my understanding, and I don't know if this is, I'm looking to you, Johnny, uh, that you had some response to proposals 3, 5, and 6, was my recollection, what the agenda stated. So I don't know if you're going to simply go through each one of those, or do you have a methodology about doing so? What I propose to do, um, and Mr. Chair, uh, Jamie, yes, thank you. Uh, is uh, in the interest of time, we've, we've now got a response to Coquitlam's proposals. I intend at the end of my presentation to give you this response in writing so that you can take it away and hopefully you will come back to the July 5th uh, meeting uh, and, and hopefully, if you can, ahead of time, uh, give us whether you think this is acceptable or whether you think certain things are tweaking or whether we've got a, a heavy session ahead of us to, to, to resolve any issues. Uh, but I think uh, rather than just pick out the three, I was, uh, I was uh, hoping Jamie would be here so he'd be able to give you some advice. But as it's in writing, then when Jamie gets back, he can give you advice uh, uh, while. Which day? I think, are you saying Jimmy? No, sorry, Jamie. Jim, Jim sorry, Jim. Jim. Get oh, Jim. I thought it was Jimmy and it was okay. one part of our team. I'm sure, I'm sure, but he's a, I'm, I'm sure. Another good mind, so you're going to I'm, 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 I'm sure you have, and as you, but as you said, Jim, Jim's your expert on this, so I, I wanted to make sure he was available to you, so. Okay. So I'm just going to run through uh, the responses. Uh, sometimes I'm, uh, sometimes I'm going to really be trying to address your issues that you said I want you to address the, the issue, as well as the proposal. And sometimes I'll take a little time so at least you can understand where we're coming from, where we're coming from, even if you agree with it or not. Okay, so uh, again, we, uh, I'll, I'll, there's some opening stuff about and, and, and that you'll read about how we try to resolve local issues, we try to develop a, an effective implementation strategy, and how we use TAC. Um, there, I, I will just address one issue just in the process and then just leave it. Uh, with Coquitlam, uh, and, and again, the, the, the mayor's referred to our October 10th letter, I think, on a number of occasions when we did set out what we understood to be your procedural problems. We did include in that uh, letter uh, what, you know, what was our response to those procedural problems. And I gather you, uh, the, the next meeting you referred to it uh, to your staff for some work and some from legal opinion. Um, we only got one response after that, and it was a phone call in November uh, from Jim uh, asking for a specific amendment. And it was the amendment to deal with redesignations of uh, uh, recreational areas, commercial recreational areas in, inside the urban containment boundary. And we were a bit taken aback by that. We didn't like it. Uh, but we said, is, do you think this will swing it, Jim? And to be fair to Jim, said, I, can't, I can never guarantee what my council is going to do, but this will sure help. And that's uh, been described before. Yeah, and, 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 and so that's, we implemented that, and we honestly thought that that had taken care of it. We thought we, we, and that was done. So that's why there's been no attention later, because we didn't hear from you again. So the, the difference, the major issue that I want to address is uh, the whole issue that the RGS uh, focused on that the RSP hadn't. 
the twin problems that go together are the relative failure to direct uh, jobs and housing to transit or into locations and the relative failure to protect and encourage the development of industrial lands for industrial purposes. And why we thought that was so important, and this has been presented many times to, to public meetings, but it's worth just going over for 25 seconds, is that diversion of jobs and the replacement of industrial lands by primarily office and, and, and shops and retail. Uh, number one has diverted the market for transit by up to 50%, uh, and, and so that undermined the, the financing of transit. You could say the, the property tax subsidy to transit is, is partially a result of, of that failure of the RSP to, to contain that employment. Uh, it created congestion on the roads because those, those areas can't be served by transit and that the Board of Trade said it was a one and a half billion dollar drain on the economy and led to a low program that again, taxpayers had to fund. Uh, to some degree, it undermined the, the, the progress of, of uh, town centers. Uh, it increased uh, the pollution uh, coming from the increased vehicular traffic, uh, which the Fraser Valley is very concerned about and the health authorities are concerned about, and that increases respiratory diseases that again, the taxpayer pays for. And it increases greenhouse gas emissions, and our calculations were uh, for the same amount of office space in, a, in a, uh, an office park in these industrial redeveloped areas was double that from the same amount in, in, the, in the downtown, and about half as much <coughs> as it would be in a regional town centre. So these were the major issues. Set aside of uh, uh, that is the economic drivers for both the development industry and municipalities. For the development industry, if everything is really stable, if there's no, never ever going to be any changes in land use designations, then essentially uh, the economic models say eventually any development in any area will simply return normal profits. Land prices may be higher, costs may be higher in a certain designation, but revenues are going to be higher and everything stabilizes so an investment in any one area will give you the same yield more or less as in any other area. And if demand doesn't change, the only way a developer can make extraordinary profits, windfall profits, is to in fact buy a piece of land at a lower cost designation and somehow manage to get the rules changed to give them extra revenue from a higher designation. And that's why it's logical that the development industry will always want the freedom to try and buy up low cost land and get those rezoning to higher designations. That's where they make super normal, super normal profits, windfall profits. And to the extent the ALR has closed off that opportunity for agricultural lands, the focus has been on industrial lands because they're the next down in the, in the hierarchy. That's normal. The problem is the behavior of municipalities and what we've, what we've called the tragedy of the commons, and I don't know, you're probably all familiar with what the tragedy of the commons is, but for, for those who aren't, it's a, it's a description of what used to happen before field enclosures, where all the peasants were allowed to graze their sheep on the commons. And everybody knew that if you overgraze the commons, that eventually no, have no nutrition left, and you'd all starve. But because there was no framework, if you put fewer sheep on the commons, your neighbour would simply put more. You restraining yourself only meant you were the loser, everybody else gained at your expense. And so everybody, pursuing their own natural interest, pursued a tragedy that they knew was going to happen. And in this context, that's what we're saying is exactly the same for municipalities with industrial land. Without a regulatory framework, Municipalities will look at the proposed redevelopment of industrial lands for this office, commercial, condos, whatever it is, and say, I can get higher taxes from this, I can get a prettier neighborhood, I can achieve some local objectives, and if I restrain myself from doing that for fear of this, or will lead to this tragedy of what will happen in the long run in terms of transit and greenhouse gases and congestion, then the next municipality will still simply take up the slack. There is no advantage for me without a strong regional framework from restraining myself to achieve these broad regional objectives. 
And that's what we found happened over the 15 years of the, of the Liverpool Regional Strategic Plan. It simply happened, and it, it didn't just happen in your uh, municipality, it happened in every municipality. And that's why we said we need a more strong regional framework so everybody plays by the same rules. And if you want flexibility, the flexibility was built in in the initial negotiations that converted some of those industrial lands to mixed employment. And you all know, I, I felt we had to give, out, give away too much there. It was a painful for us to see how much industrial land we converted uh, to mixed employment in order to achieve agreement and to give that flexibility, but that's what we've done. Now, if you make it easier, and again, we've, we've, we've made it easier, to redesignate. We've made it easier to redesignate insofar as the amendment process is now 50% plus one. And even more, you're only required to have general consistency. So you can bring forward your original conflict <coughs> statement that makes its own little amendments within it. To, so you're not generally consistent, you're not consistent with the plan, you're only generally consistent. And that's a 50% plus one vote. And in your original conflict statement, you have actually got access to dispute resolution. But the easier we make it, the more we encourage those who want to invest in those lands to speculate you might get a rezoning, the more they will be encouraged. So the easier it was in the old days to get an agricultural redesignation, the more people speculated in agricultural land for non-agricultural purposes. I used to get wonderful proposals in Richmond for hotels and Guns worth in the agricultural area. To the extent you close that off, you discourage that investment. And here's what I'm saying, that if you, if you make it easier, the speculative investment actually rise, raises the industrial land prices. Because now the land prices start to take on this speculative value. And you make it uneconomic for the industrial investor to invest in industrial land. The land price has now gone beyond what the numbers make his numbers go around. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you say, here's the industrial land base, but I'm going to make it real easy to change, people will buy that industrial land and bid up the land so that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Industry will fail. And that's why, to some degree, we can't you know, kind of support a process that says, here's a, here's a, here's a land use strategy but we're going to make it so easy to redesignate that it only takes a 33% vote to ratify a redesignation. And you said you'd live with the legislation. The legislation does contemplate a 50% acceptance of your regional context statement, which is the vehicle where you bring forward your changes. So in, in respect to option one, where you're concerned about the ability of a local municipality to make those redesignations easier. What we're saying back to you is your regional context statement is the vehicle, and I think one of the staff said this, your regional context statement is the vehicle whereby you bring forward your refinements and amendments to your regional context statement is where you bring forward your changes in future. And that's a 50% plus one vote, and it has room to dispute resolution. And we think that's, that's if we went any lower, notwithstanding the fact that we don't think it's contemplated in the legislation, if we went any lower than that, we would defeat the purpose of trying to preserve industrial land and try and stop the spread of employment. It, you know, the speculative prices were making a self-fulfilling prophecy that you go there. So that's, that's why we've, we've, we've uh, said we've done what we can and made it easier than the Liverpool Regional Strategic Plan to amend this plan and gone with the rules on regional context statements and built in the further flexibilities that the TAC group built in to those amendments and regional context statements. So you don't have to come to the board at all for certain amendments. But these large scale, unlimited changes contemplated by your proposal one really don't fit that model. And so we don't have much of a, an attempt to, a, a chance to deal with it. On proposal two, uh, the ratification and the review every five years. If there is a problem with the regional growth strategy, but it is a problem, or one or two problems, you don't want to wait 
for a five-year review. You want to put that on the table as an amending process. And if you're concerned about how that's dealt with, then I think it I think the board would normally do this, but we could formalize it in some way. That if a municipality wants to bring forward a concern with a regional growth strategy and seek an amendment, that that proposal will be required to be referred to staff for a report and even to TAC for a report. So that the, the, there is a certain amount of you know, professional uh, reflection and, and uh, adjudication on that before it comes back to the board. It's simply not brushed off the table. And that is the route, I think, for you to deal with any concerns that says, I'm locked into this for 30 years and this is obviously not working. A five-year review, on the other hand, is a different animal. A five-year review is something that says, is a, is, a, is a decision you don't want to take lightly. It's not like us sitting around a room having a chat. I think this one, this one might have been extraordinary, but I doubt it. This one has probably cost ugh, about $7 million to the region, and probably about the same amount, again, in terms of community uh, input and staff time for all the others. So you're talking probably at least $10 million for a five-year review, and you may be looking at that and saying, I don't want to review every part of this plan. 60% of it is working just fine. 70% of it is just working fine. I don't want to go through one of those $10 million exercises. I want to go through a $200,000 exercise to really nail down what's wrong with the mixed employment policy or what's wrong with the agricultural policy. So any kind of uh, process which would be open to you, I think it is open to you under, under the legislation, open to the board under the legislation, to build in a compulsory review after five years, I don't think I don't think the board, and given your expressed concerns about uh, costs and staff time, I don't think you would want to say, yeah, every five years we're going to give the planners a bonanza uh, and a ten million dollar budget to spend another couple of years reviewing the plan. So we're we're going to suggest to you that the amendment process, specific amendment process, is the route to go if you have concerns with the plan, that it's not the whole damn plan is, is awful. If you've got specific concerns with the plan, even if they're more than one, then you don't have to wait for the five-year review. Propose, a, a, propose an amendment, and, and we will try and formalize that that amendment proposal uh, not only will be forced to go to staff for a report, but if you like, it can go to TAC for, for something. So it's not just the regional staff, if you don't trust the regional staff. Uh, it's the municipal staff as well to add their comments and come back to the board. But the decision, obviously, an amendment to the plan is obviously got to be by a 50% vote of the, of the, of the board. That, that, that's always the case. And again, I, I really underline the fact that if, if the way the plan applies to your municipality is giving you a problem, that's what your regional contact statement is for. That's the way you, you amend your OCP, amend your regional context statement, and if it requires board ratification, then that's a 50% plus one vote with access to dispute resolution uh, that you can have. On, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Just with respect to when you said, I think the board would do this anyhow, but we might be prepared to formalize yeah. referring it up to staff or TAC or some such thing without committing to any of that. What do you, uh, maybe this is a question you don't need to have answered, but just for the guy who doesn't know what's going on in the room, what do you mean by formalize? You could adopt a formal policy, you could amend the procedure by law. I'm not quite entirely quite sure what is the most okay. appropriate one to do, but it would be something that said, this is the policy of the board. Uh, this is the procedure by law of the board. And when we get a thing, we will automatically do this. There's no question, there's no vote of the board to refer it to staff. Nobody can say this is stupid, we don't want to hear it. There's a procedure by law that says, whenever we get one of these proposals, we've got to take it seriously, at least to the fact that we'll get a, a professional report back or a referral to TAC for a TAC report back. Uh, and that will give you some assurance that those kind of things are being taken seriously. Thank you. Well, that was just for my benefit, but... On, uh, on proposal three, um, this, is, this is where, actually, the, the reverse was occurring for me, May. Um, I was way more comfortable with your actual proposal 
than I was with the background to the expression of concern. So just allow me two minutes to, to get my hurt feelings. Uh, Let me see how I hurt you first. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this proposal three is to ensure the efficient use of metro resources. It's the internal metrics uh, oh, that's there. Okay. Sure. And, and here you're asking for metrics on how much time how much time staff was uh, devoted to implementing this, uh, whether it was more or less than before, um, uh, what, the, what the spending was on monitoring and so on, and, uh, and then the amendments approved and rejected, okay? Uh, so, okay so. And the implication is that we don't do that, although we wouldn't do that. And, our, and the implication is that this specific plan is going to be the cause of Lord knows what additional costs and staff time because of this increased complexity. So if you wouldn't mind, and I, I think I have copies, this, and, and, and I can understand as a counselor, you might not have access to that. Maybe if, if I can just ask you to just pass that down. Right to go what, I'm, what I'm showing you is an excerpt from this, which is familiar known as the Grey Book. Yes. You know the Grey Book name. This is what we produce every year as part of our budget process. And this is just the excerpt for, from the regional planning function. And you'll see it sets out uh, what the staffing is. It sets out what the expenditure is. It sets out what it was last year and how it's changed year over year. It sets out what the purpose is, and it sets out what we intend to achieve in the coming year in terms of milestones. It's difficult to be more detailed than this. We've made this, we used to actually give this to the municipal staff every year until about three years, they cried uncle and said, for God's sake, please don't give us this anymore. It's way too detailed, it's way too much work for us to look at. But it's still available should anybody have any concerns about anything. I took a copy and gave it to staff. Yeah. They, they cried uncle. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we do we do try and be as open and transparent, and, and you made the point maybe it, this should be with every program. It is. There's over 200 programs in here, and, and, and we, we show this. We come out, and never, anybody can see it. Probably nobody does because staff will show, you know, staff will pass it along. But it's there. Uh, and we have said, and in the in the second meeting we went through how many how many things would come to the board as opposed to how many things are dealt with by municipalities. And I think we went through that development permits would be developed uh, would be handled by you as municipalities under guidelines from your OCP wouldn't come to the board. Rezonings with your OC, consistent with your OCP would be de developed by you wouldn't come to the board. OCP amendments consistent with the original context statement wouldn't come to the board. Even those that are inconsistent but meet those exemptions wouldn't come to the board. So very, very few, maybe one in 100, would come to the board. And so the idea that we would be required to put that in our regional, com in our regional growth strategy, when in fact when you look at your OCP, which deals with 100 times as many applications doesn't require that kind of data to produce in your OCP. It makes it, it probably wasn't intended that way, and it's the solution that's being put forward, not the concern, but it feels like a cheap shot. It feels like somebody's just taking a shot at the region uh, when we're doing our best to manage our budget and we're transparent with our budget and say so you want some additional stuff. So now I've got my hurt feelings on the table. I've got my red De Bono hat on and off. Uh, I'm feeling better. I, okay. So now we will say if the, the specific metrics you've proposed in terms of the staff, uh, the staffing, if you want it precisely, more precisely related to how, how much was related to approval of regional context statements or any amendments, if you want that reported on an annual basis as part of our budget process in this kind of format, we will do it. And if you want to have the report on how much staff time 
was spent on that and how that changes year over year after year, and before and after the plan, we will do it as part of this process. And if you want the uh, metrics on how many applications were received and how many approved and how many received, uh, uh, denied, we have an annual report. I mean, you, you've probably seen the, the metrics that we put in the plan, all the other performance metrics. Uh, we produce an annual report. Have you got one to show me? This is our 2002 annual report on the Liverpool Region Strategic Plan. Uh, that's a document that is, uh, um, takes as much more effort goes into writing it than has ever gone into reading it. Uh, but we will be produce this, we will produce this every year, and we will include those metrics in, in this, uh, the metrics you requested in this plan. And, and in fact, if you've got any other suggested metrics that we can easily get in addition to the ones we put in the plan, and in addition to the ones you've, you've uh, put forward, we'll put it in, in, we'll put it in, the, in this report. Uh, and I hope that goes to some way to show that we're willing to do that. We're willing to do that, happy to do that. Uh, that's the way we go. Dispute resolution. Does that mean you accept our proposal? Uh, uh, except for the fact we don't need to put it in. We don't need to amend the regional growth strategy to say that. Uh, we will put it because we we'll accept the words of proposal three. Yep. I know they're different. Way. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, now, proposal number four. <coughs> The way I interpret it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it essentially, you're trying to say, if there is any decision by the Metro Board that a municipality disagrees with in connection with the original growth strategy, you want to have some access to an appeal process, a dispute resolution process. And if I've understood that correctly, um, that, that, that is not currently what we believe is envisaged in the legislation. But more to the point, it opens up a very slippery slope, a door that I don't think you want to open. And I don't know what experience you've got with the Ontario system. I have a lot. Peter, Peter has. Is, is, an, is that what Johnny's asked? Is that the way we understand? Uh, I don't believe it. I'll let I, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's bang on, um, but I, I think that's not going to change what Johnny wants to, to say. Well, so let's hear that first. We can respond if, in writing, but I, well, I wouldn't say that's what we're saying. If I've got it wrong, I need to know before I stop. That's why I asked. Yeah. So, um, so that might change. change. What I'm understanding yeah. when I boil down proposal number four dispute resolution, it says any member has the right to disagree, and then upon formal notification, the non binding dispute resolution process will initially occur. And then there's a whole bunch of details of, of how you want that to occur, uh, but with, uh, with the final step that if you don't agree after 60 days, it goes to arbitration. I got that wrong. The legislation envisions, as you're correct, which is where you're really going, that it's, uh, it envisions an arbitration route, both in terms of process we're in now, as related to the RGS, and primarily around RCS. Um, our concern then is that disputes are going to happen and more so over time perhaps more than the one in a hundred that you're experiencing now uh, because things do change over time. So as that happens right now as you've pointed out there is an arbitration process available on that condition. Our question and our jumping off point around our issue is that more and more disputes are going to happen in part because of flexibility around some of the definitions, the flexibility of some of the mapping. So how do we make sure that when those disputes of 22 different municipalities trying to apply an RCS, that as you point out in, in your section 626 are generally consistent, in good faith, 22 municipalities are likely to have different interpretations of those definitions. Can we avoid arbitration? Is there a process, and it was only jumping off suggestion, that might prevent this kind of process? Okay. And the only thing that I would add to that is we found definition of this dispute process for us. We felt that agreement up front of the steps to go through might be of assistance if and when those disputes does happen, do happen. Okay. Um, I think your proposal has two components. One is the scope of the appeal process and the other one is the actual form of the appeal process. And I think what I see in your proposal is the expansion of the scope of the appeal process 
from not simply the non-acceptance of a regional context statement. Uh, you know, let's say we've got the plan in place, so we know we've got uh, uh, dispute over the acceptance of the plan. But once the plan is in place, the legislation essentially talks about acceptance and non-acceptance of the regional context statement. And that's really where most of the action is. Yeah. And you have access to dispute resolution over that. The arbitration process. Uh, the dispute resolution. Um, yeah, it's arbitration, if you like, but they call it dispute resolution in the, in the act. Um, so you've got access to that. What you're saying is... The form of that... I get to the form. I got to, I got to the form. I'll get to the form. There is a process outlined in the act. Yeah, yeah. There's a process, but what your, one part of your proposal is to expand that to any decision by the region on regional planning. I think we'd be, we'd be fine to hear your proposal on that. If you feel that's a particular point, we'd love to caucus and talk about that. I think okay. the, the interest was, was there an opportunity so, where the legislation so long was as I, So long as I understand that, that's, yep. that's the scope. I'm just trying to clarify. So, so you've got the two issues. Yeah. One is that it seems to expand the number of disputes that end up in this process called dispute resolution in your side of the table and arbitration in ours. Um, and then the, and the other one is the form. Okay. okay. So the form. So, so now I'm going to deal with the scope because at the moment, the legislation, the legislation really does focus you down to that one point, that one point of intersection of the regional context statement. This is where you bring forward what essentially will be the regional plan as it applies to your municipality. Once the regional context statement is in place, then the regional context statement is, you know, that's your guiding light, no matter what the plan says, uh, and, and so that's available to you. Yeah. But if, the, if you expand it to any decision, so the board wants to make a change in policy. The board wants to change in the way things are implemented. The board wants to change a difference in the policy, how servicing is, is incorporated into the plan. Any of these decisions, plus any amendments it makes to its own plan, you're now saying is appealable. And I'm saying, number one, that, that's unnecessary, uh, and secondly, increases the, the number of, of arbitrations that are possible. But secondly, and I think this is the thing you really have to worry about, and I would worry about, is it opens the door for an Ontario Municipal Board type solution. The Ontario Municipal, in, in Ontario, any planning decision by any municipality on appeal to the minister is referable to the Ontario Municipal Board. And the net result of that is now the average rezoning in in Ontario, I believe, takes three to five years to get through because it's not municipalities who like it, they hate it. It's not developers who like it, they hate it. But citizens groups now have a way to second guess their councils. Citizens groups can take that to the municipal board. Just to be clear, we are not advocating an OMB you're in the situation. I have a lot of experience with that. We are not advocating that. If you look at the Ontario situation, 95 to 95 five percent of those are disputes initiated by citizens or developers. We are not talking about yeah, that. I, within I, what the legislation contemplates, Johnny, I don't think we are extending authority within the RCS. It's, was there another possibility is what we wanted to discuss, not an OMB solution. Johnny's looking intent at me. I don't know if that means that, that he wants to get through this or you actually want to begin to machinate over these these views. I, I'd, I'd like to finish a sentence. Okay. I, I, I kind of... I, mean, I, know you, I, I know yeah. how you feel. I'm with the mayor on this protocol. Okay. I'd like to finish. So there's a non-interruption suggestion. I here. kind of, I recognize what the Coquitlam, in fact, I said. <coughs> Coquitlam isn't proposing this. But if you put in the clause that a municipality can appeal any decision by the region, why would a citizens group not say, well, gee, the same rules should apply to a council? If you're, if you've got, if you've got the philosophy that you can appeal anything the region, the region decides, then you're opening the door to that. And like Pete, I had, I, in fact, longer than Pete, I had six years at the Ontario Municipal Board. I think the, the last one I dealt with, uh, uh, wasn't the last one, but the biggest one I dealt with was the longest quasi-judicial process in the history of this country. Uh, total costs were nearly $100 million. Uh, and it's a very adversarial process, and you leave a, lot, leave a lot of shattered bodies along the way. You don't want to go anywhere near that. You don't want to go anywhere near that. And I think the proposal that even suggests that a decision by a political body, any, any decision by a political body should be automatically appealable, is pointing the direction that way. And, and I go back to the fact, I don't think you need it. I think a regional context statement is your vital part, 
you don't want to have the ability to go and have the right to appeal somebody else's regional context statement. You're opening it up too wide. In fact, I think you're actually uh, inadvertently under the kind of inadvertent consequences with the combination of this widening of the appeal and the one-third threshold, you really do give the larger municipalities the ability to challenge just about anything and challenge take almost anything to arbitration. So we're really suggesting that, the, that what we've got in place really gives you a lot of comfort because it should give you a lot of comfort under the regional contact statement and a lot of comfort under the, under the ability to amend. And you don't want to go near, near this appeal process beyond the regional context statement because the implications of what you might be opening up, the kind of words you, want, you might be opening up. And you know, if Pete's, Pete had a couple of years of experience, I had six, and we both were five years experience in Ontario, I had, I, had, I had six doing it. And both of us, that's one thing we would agree on. Yes, we would. You don't want to go near it. Uh, proposals five and six. Pretty certain that we weren't any. Yeah, we yeah, weren't any. Yeah. Okay. Proposals five and six, and we're going to put these together because we think they're interconnected. Can address the four part? Oh, oh so. thank you, thank you, thank you, Pete. Um, we understand the frustration in negotiating a form of arbitration, and we understand that that is something that requires patience on both sides and frustration on both sides when we don't agree. And you are frustrated. We were frustrated and we gave in most of the time. Uh, Maybe keep it to the legislation. Go ahead. But, okay, okay. Don't get there. Let's just keep going. But, in a roll here. But it is surely hubris, at the very least, to say that the dispute resolution process that we have decided is appropriate for this particular circumstance, for this particular board, and this particular council, is the right fit and the appropriate one for every solution, every issue that will be faced by any future board and by any future council. The legislation says we give the boards and the councils of the future the opportunity to talk it through. And they'll have, as guidelines if they want it, the process that we set down here. They can refer back to it as precedent and say, here's a, here's a, here's a good idea, we like this. Well, here's a terrible idea. We don't think it should be in, in public or not. <coughs> they can do that. But to enshrine it in the regional growth strategy, to say here in 2011, the wise heads around this table are going to prescribe and confine what future councils and future boards may do, notwithstanding the freedom that's provided them in the legislation to negotiate their own process, seems inappropriate and unnecessary. And so we can document what process we've gone through and undoubtedly Coquitlam may want to put down something that says for the advice of all future councils we recommend you start with this process. But to ask the board to go through and hold up the regional growth strategy and amend the regional growth strategy to put in a solution a prescription for all future councils, for all future boards, for all future issues, just seems unacceptable. So I'll now go on to five and six. Okay. Um, here, I don't think there's any difference in intent, purpose, or values between Kokoma and the region. Consistency, by and large, is a good thing, notwithstanding that. Whoever said it was the hobgoblin of little minds. Yes, consistency is normally a good thing, and trying to define regional significance is generally a good thing. What the planners will tell you, and they repeated the experience themselves, is the attempt to reduce the complexity of deciding these things to a simple set of principles and a simple set of formulas usually puts you in more trouble than not. A, a small piece of industrial land going to mixed employment on the edge of an industrial area may be of no significance at all. The same amount of land in the middle of the industrial area may be a disaster. A residential development just outside the town centre, we wouldn't even care about it regionally. That same regional 
development in the middle of an industrial area or the middle of an uh, agricultural area would be a disaster. And so the complexity of what constitutes something that is regional significance in any context, the planners are telling us, and I agree with them, uh, used to be all ones, getting better now, but it used to be all ones, is that that is too complex. The set of principles that you would come up with would not help you. There are just so many factors that have to be put down there that you couldn't come up with some kind of list of, here's your laundry list of factors to be considered. You couldn't weigh them. You couldn't put weights attached to them that would give you a nice, easy guidance to say, here's the outcome. And if you did, this is, I think, the point made earlier, you might live to regret it. In fact, the regional factor is what is regionally significant. I think we've all said industri industry is regionally significant. And one could imagine a set of factors that said, if land is currently in industrial use and it's near a waterfront and it's near a, an expressway and it's near a railway, it should be preserved as industry. And just about all the gains, the equipment gains, that Jim McIntyre made in negotiation go flying out the window. You actually got more accommodation, I would suggest, respectfully. You got more accommodation in the negotiation that we had by mixing the notion of what is regionally significant and what is locally significant and hashing it out through the negotiation process and the input from TAC than we would have got if we'd have simply set out a set of criteria and a definition of regional significance and then let it roll. However, here we go. If all that doesn't convince you, and you're determined to give this a second shot, at the pain of never being spoken to again by the members of the Titan Group, we would be willing to say, we would refer this question again to the TAC Working Group. We would be happy if it were chaired again by your planning director. We would be happy to give it a year to come up with a statement of whether they think it is desirable or feasible to introduce a definition of regional significance and come up with a framework to consistently apply that. And we would even be prepared to provide a modest budget to, to fund that exercise if you wanted to. That would be an assignment, a commitment by the board to assign that task to uh, the tech group and receive their report within a year. And whether they thought it was desirable or feasible to come up with a definition of regional significance and a framework in which to apply that in future to address the issues you've got. Again, our, our issue is not one of purpose or values here or principle. Our question is, is it practical? That was in fact the question that the regional planning committee put to the TAC group. And you've heard what they did and what their response was. But we're willing if you think they, if they had a longer time period, they only had a summer to deal with this, if they had a longer time period uh, to have another go at it and come up with something more acceptable to you, then we're prepared to go on. Um, I'm not expecting a response to this response now. That's only fair. Uh, we will we'll give you a written copy of the expanded version of this to take away. We request that if you could, Give us your response, what's acceptable, what isn't. I think you just said it's kind of a bit of a package deal here. Operate them in this proposal, in this in this phase, it's much more simple under the proposed regional growth strategy to amend it after it's adopted than during this acceptance phase. But if you if this is if this is sufficient for us to say, yeah, we can now accept the regional growth strategy with these commitments and the option for you to bring forward further amendments to the regional growth strategy considered after this acceptance phase is closed. And then I think we can say we're back on track to working together towards something that we can all agree to. If you have some counter proposals, it would be really useful for us to receive them before July the 5th, because that gives you a week or so, and give us at least a day so that we can come into the into the into the July the 5th with a hope to try and nail this down on July the 5th. I think that's what we're all trying to do is nail this down on July the 5th. We're getting, we, I think we're getting close. 
me and Peter both, I think, want to chime in. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah and just a question. Uh, we'll, we'll have a comment. I, I agree totally with uh, advance uh, information always makes these sessions more productive and uh, we could have gone further along if we got some advanced stuff. We will do everything that we can to get you advanced stuff so at least you can read it and discuss it, that kind of stuff. With respect to capturing, if we do reach resolution, uh, how do you propose to capture? Is this a form of implementation agreement or is this simply uh, a commitment on your part or like, like I'm interested in what you're proposing in terms of how to capture any of these uh, kind of agreements we've reached. If, if there's agreement at this table, we take it back to the board. The board, we put it to the board and say, endorse this. And then if the instrument, the appropriate instrument, is an implementation agreement, uh, then, then that's the way you are envisioning an agreement. An as agreement. to simply a motion. An uh, agreement or an amendment to the procedure bylaw or a policy or some kind of formal instrument that says this, this wasn't just a handshake at the end of July the 5th. Yeah. Uh, this was a formal decision. I, I think we will need a formal instrument of some sort. The form or flexible, but I mean, it's simply not a motion that then can be changed by one party later. It has to be some kind of formal agreement. Those are my only questions. Okay. Uh, may, may, Councillor Reed did want to make a, make a comment specifically uh, to the idea. Well, well let me, may make the comment. Okay. Well, this is going to come as a huge surprise to you, but back to proposal number two, the five-year kick clause. Yeah. And I've heard over and over that um, you are not willing to put this in, especially with the solution that we have, I think it was 30% or 35% or whatever it was. So I came up with two other bright ideas, both of which, well, one of which was certainly shot down, I think. But I had wondered if there was a, a process by way of if someone wanted to enter um, something for a five-year for a five-year look, see whether it be a portion of the agreement or whatever. Most of the stuff that you're talking about, and I found here today that everybody's talking about things that are uh, the ability to work with them is within the regional context statement. I'm talking about the actual the document. To me, they're two, although they're, they're still two separate things. One of the things that my colleague, my process person here, who I'm absolutely delighted to have been able to work with in the last few years, came up with something called adaptive management, which you put in um, most of your agreements. And it says, as the region grows and changes, and we'll talk about the water one, the science of water management improves and public values evolve. Um, the drinking water management plan will be reviewed and revised so we could substitute that for the RGS. An adaptive management approach is proposed with a DWMP progress report every two years and a comprehensive review of the plan every five years. I like that. I like that a lot. I like that so much that I'd like you to put in the RGS. And don't tell me you've never done it before. Okay, you sure you have. And you've done it several times. My, my, uh, my, and thank you for the proposal. Uh, <laughs> and, I didn't um, even get down on one knee. So. Yeah. <laughs> My, uh, my ungallant reply is um, uh, most of it I can accept. It is the commitment to the review. The drinking water plan, the drinking water management plan, for example, we've just reviewed. I mean, the, the first three plans under the regional growth strategy have all gone through a five year review this year. And the amount of effort that goes into that, the amount of consultation that goes into that, is nowhere near what has to go into the regional growth strategy because of the enormous complexity of legislation. If it was just, if I, if I didn't have to go, I mean, the, even, even the tricky water plan uh, involves me with the REACT Water Subcommittee and a lot of negotiation with REACT. But I don't have to go around and negotiate with 21 municipalities for all the different fine grain things. It's just not that significant to them. It's a regional issue and it's, it's, you know, I can do it in six months uh, at a relatively small cost. If, if, if we were able, and I'm flying without consultation of my political masters here, but if we are saying instead of a full review, we would have a workshop, something like that, where we committed to having, at the end of every five years, we would go and commit to having a workshop where all the uh, municipalities could have representations. And we'd discuss, how did, how did it work the last five years? 
the big word here is will. Yeah, will. Yeah. Uh, Every five years, the regional district has to uh, consider whether the strategy must be reviewed for possible amendment. <coughs> Just one minute. For the purposes of that subsection, <coughs> which I take it as part of the process, the regional district must provide, must provide, an opportunity for input on the need for review from the persons, organizations, and authorities referred to in Section 855 of Sub 2. So what I'm saying is, you, at the end of this process, every five years you go through this process where you get all this input from all these parties, and then at the end of that, you have to, the board decides whether it is to be reviewed. So isn't, I mean, aren't they just suggesting a part of that whole uh, consultation? Or are you, Johnny, suggesting that's the mechanism for that consultation? What I'm proposing is there may be a concern, I don't know, but there may be a concern that what that says out, and that legislation says out, is yes, we are supposed to consult and provide input, but that might mean, in the worst of all possible worlds, we phone up Ray and and say, have you got any input? You send us a letter and we put it in the pending file and, uh, and do some, you know, thanks for your input, but we didn't agree with it. And, and what I'm suggesting is we, we could consider a workshop, a commitment to a workshop where we sit around and and have all the municipals represented. So, so that we actually have a process where you get to say your say in front of all the other municipalities and we get to listen to and we have a constructive process and it could take a day, it could take two days. But at the end of that, then we'd say, is it going is it is it is it going well? Is it going generally well, and we just want to have a look at that section, or is the whole damn thing a disaster and it needs a total review? Mm -hmm. And if, if you had that kind of process, then you would, we would give you some assurance. I'm, I'm hurt again that you think you need it, but I, I'm You're over that. I'm, 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 I'm delicate. I'm, I'm delicate, man. You know, uh, but 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 uh, but you would have some assurance that any input you got was was now in a workshop format and couldn't just be sloughed off. Hmm. I want to assure you to begin with that part of our problem is that we don't think you'll be able to be here forever. <laughs> um, and it may well be that you'll have to be replaced. And at some point, uh, we could end up with someone far less reasonable than you. Um, the, uh, the other reality, though, is that the two uh, that, uh, the, that uh, Mayor Brody just read out, um, the course the actual pattern that the, the review could take place in this meeting room in, in, at the board could be on the consent agenda. I mean, it could just be, a, a, here's, uh, this is the mandatory review. They, I, I'm, so, so we're going to consider, we're going to go back and contemplate whether a workshop is the solution or whether that's the, the because I do want us to be able to examine it. And, um, and particularly if someone has raised an issue on it, I want us all to be able to examine it. Because I don't think, in our experience, Coquitlam's objections never actually got to the table, never got to the minds of the folks around the board table, um, partly because of the way in which they were characterized in staff reports and such. And I'm not sure that, that we were ever, ever able to um, have our, our real objections uh, raised at the level of the board. And uh, I, I would hope that we'd have a process that would, would encourage that. I would have done that. Uh, I thought the process was going to unfold differently and then when we saw the staff report that's what caused me to sit down and we all sat down and we figured out the staff report says we're fundamentally, the objections are fundamentally associated with the legislation which as we now see they weren't about the legislation and the Coquitlam's objections cannot be resolved and I, I think we're now getting to the point where we, perhaps in the last few minutes we realized that objections might well be able to be resolved. And, uh, and I, I have absolute confidence that they can be. And I said that then, and I, and I continue to reiterate that. So I, I agree, uh, uh, with Chair Jackson, that we came at it from a, from a perspective that uh, we might come at it differently in the context of what we learned in the last uh, few months. OK. 
Okay. I think I think if we look over our shoulders at where we've been, we'll tend to go in different directions. Where yes. we're going. Absolutely. And so I'm not going to respond <laughs> to to what you just said, rather than say if we've now got some things on the table that uh, when you reflect on it in the next few days, you think you know our our a response that at least go some way towards meeting your concerns and don't involve us in the things that we're telling you we would have not just difficulty we would we, we have no appetite to go for which is you know, anything to do with a one-third vote is something that we can't get to but anything to do with something that says yeah you can you can trigger an amendment on your own all you need to get is a seconder and we'll put in an implementation agreement to process to deal uh, to make sure that implement uh, that, that proposed amendment gets appropriate professional attention. And after five years, you know, we won't commit to a review because that's a five, ten million dollar <laughs> commitment. But we'll commit to a workshop uh, and a process whereby you can have an exploration of that. And then all of you, all the elected officials who are responsible for answering to the taxpayer can decide whether you want to go on that eight, ten million dollar expedition. Then, if, if that goes somewhere, then, then maybe we'll focus on where we're going rather than where we're being. And there's 10 minutes left. I think this is there's a good momentum here, and there's a lot to consider, um, and I think there's a lot of things that can be done between now and then. Between by, by then, I mean July the 5th, and we have to confirm that there is a willingness and an appetite to meet there. I'm convinced there absolutely is, and uh, there is things to think about and talk about between now and then. So there's two or three things I have to tie up. Um, one, one thing I would suggest in your interim discussions is think about this notion of uh, what, uh, Peter, you were raising. Uh, how do you formalize this? Should it be in an implementation agreement? Should it be in a policy? Should it be in a, some amendment? Think about that. Give, some, give that some thought. But my understanding is there's an agreement that um, the written proposal that, that reflects what you just described out loud will be provided to everybody. They'll have a chance to consider it. And in terms of responses to that or suggestions or tweaks, you would hope to receive any of that uh, notification at least a day before July the 5th, if not sooner. Um, and I think the hope is with, with a bit of that backing and forth in pre-July 5th, there's a, hopefully a good possibility that with that groundwork laid, there's a good possibility that, that you could uh, go some distance in resolving this. Maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I, I really think you made some progress but I won't speak for anybody in, in terms of where they're at. But that sounds to me like next steps. But I do need a commitment, at least a commitment. Uh, first of all, I have to report to the minister, which really is a report to the ministry who then briefs her, uh, with respect to where you're at. And it doesn't have to be long and detailed. Um, also with respect to what are your intentions from today forward. That's pretty much what needs to be known. And there needs to be a commitment that the tentative date of July 5th is agreed to by those at this table, uh, and they'll be uh, you know, re-engaging re at that time. Speaking on behalf of, of our side, um, I would. Uh, we've seen your draft report. Uh, we would totally endorse that report plus a section covering today and uh, with a summary comment saying that you believe significant progress has been made, the parties have agreed to meet one further time on July 5th and uh, you believe that there is uh, a reasonable likelihood of success at that point and that the process should be extended till that time. That would be from our perspective. I don't know if uh, Metro would agree with that. My beliefs are, are going to be one thing, but I, if I'm reflecting your belief, then I'm, then I'm in good shape. I mean, if you're, I think there's... We've said that they're confident that we can resolve this. Okay. So I, I will be glad to reflect that. That's what I'm reflecting. I want to make sure I'm reflecting the, the party's desire that there's willingness to go ahead, there's likelihood of, of resolution, and you're going to meet again. In fairness, I said we were, I was confident that we could resolve this. And I said that on April 17th as well. And I, I'm still confident that we could resolve this because I, I hear on almost all the issues the, the pattern of, uh, of resolution. Jamie, I, I, I think if you over over discuss this, we might start going backwards again. Yes, I disagree. <laughs> right. I think there's a commitment to meet on the fifth. I think you can say we're we we there's yeah there's, there's, the, the last two meetings have been constructive. We've got closer together than we were when we started, and we want to. I think both parties want to to come to the fifth in the hope and belief that we can nail it that day. That's what I'm going to reflect. 
tell that the minister then. Yeah, that, that, that's going out. Uh, and I might be in touch with staff tomorrow about maybe a call in advance of the July 5th meeting to true up agendas and et cetera, et cetera. Any closing comments, or do you just want to walk away with a good feeling? So it's 1 o'clock on the 5th, right? My understanding is there's an agreement that we can begin at noon on the 5th, is my recollection. Noon? That's what I recall staff agreeing to. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, it seems to me that um, in terms of the form of any kind of resolution we can make, I mean, let's not let any form of resolution uh, hang up the process. Uh, and, and my suggestion is that there be some discussion between the CAOs. Uh, you know, on that issue. I mean, if you've got a favorite or if we've got a favorite, then I mean, let's say so. But from our perspective, there has to be a, some kind of two way deal. And I think and we're open to alternate vehicles, but it has to be some form of two way vehicle, which is a good little sign of the uh, I want to reiterate that before going further. Staff to staff should work out what's the right format of this, where's the formalities, implementation agreement, is it elsewhere? Talk about that beforehand. Don't let that hang you up. Now, if, if I could add one more thing, though. In terms of process, uh, this has been delegated to the Intergov Committee for Metro Vancouver, uh, and we, uh, of Metro Vancouver, and we'll, we'll be reporting back to the board. But you've only got the mayor and two councillors here. Wouldn't the next step then be for you to take it to your council? Uh, if if we if we have agreement between the parties, that agreement would be subject to, to board approval and subject to council approval. And uh, and I think both sides have to be reasonably comfortable. They can convince uh, their respective board and council to go along with it. But it is subject to that. Uh, understood. Staff. Understood. But but we have more people here from Metro Vancouver than I believe. You know, you've got a third of your council basically. And, and the third represents the various right. sectors. Uh, we've got some have about a third of the board here. So, so we have to approve it first. Yeah. Okay. So you're, we're saying this. Yeah. And, 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 and what we're uh, and, and what we're saying is Why? that. We would have an agreement that we approve, that's subject to both, uh, and if uh, the, the board wants us to consider it first, uh, we'll see what we can do to, to, to deal with that. Of course. Okay. And there's no, no. Uh, that's right. any any kind of yeah, okay. any kind of negotiation yeah. is always subject, subject to, to, to the, the parties. <laughs> and you uh, you have uh, labor negotiations that's subject to a vote on there and it's a vote on the council. So it's the same yeah. kind of thing. Uh, and presumably, okay. I, I just okay. Does anybody want to do the last quick comment? Everybody wants to leave. They want to keep this good momentum going. Um, I just I just want to say, in just over a day, we're going to celebrate a democracy that is that is the envy of the world. And I, I think it's partly because of this kind of process. I'm sorry, I I I, I haven't enjoyed this process, but I'm glad that we're getting so far along. Okay, good, good, good for everybody. Uh, I'll be in touch with staff about a call. You're going to do the stuff in, in the interim. And Johnny, the paper for this, are you going to send it out to people? I've just given the, the written proposal. It does not contain the workshop proposal because we just made that up. And, and I reiterate we again that? that if you have a written Okay, is that clear to everybody? And, 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 yeah, everybody's as, and as in the past, if you have a written proposal a couple of days before, if we get it ahead of time, we can actually, I realize you're in a negotiating position, but we've always tried to give you our proposals ahead of time. Okay, you've got the proposals in writing. There's going to be discussions between staff in the interim. You're going to come prepared to respond. I need one of those. Thank you. It's at least one. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. See you on the 5th. I'll be in touch with staff about a call to set up next uh, agenda. Thank you so much.